Hey guys, Aaron Miles here with On Tilt Gaming, going to be bringing you my full set review of Ancient Knights. First off, this video was sponsored by our friends over at Volt Magic. If you want to stock up on singles from the set, maybe buy a few boxes, definitely check them out over at voltmagic.ca, and their uh, information will be available both in the description of this video and on otgaming.com. This especially goes out to our Canadian viewers who can save a good bit of money on shipping by checking them out. So without further ado, here is my full set review of Ancient Knights. Alright guys, just so you know, when it comes to this set review, I am going to be focusing entirely on New Frontiers. Obviously there is the draft format to look into when you get a set like this. However, being that I come from Yu-Gi-Oh, I'm not very experienced in drafting, so if I were to try to do that kind of stuff mixed in with the New Frontiers, first off, this video would run about five hours long. Second off, you actually wouldn't get too much insight, so I'm going to let someone else handle that. So, going forward, everything that I'm going to be talking about is in the context of New Frontiers. So, we're going to start off with card number one, Conjure, Construct on Conjure Constructs. Sorry. Uh, so you put three five five light golem tokens into the field with mobilize two. Obviously, this card is absolutely garbage unless you are running Pandora. You don't want mobilize two on your five fives. That's just entirely too much mana. So it would be three mana to play this card and then six mana to attack with all three golems. However, if you're playing Pandora, that kind of offsets this a bit. Although even on the ruler's side, you know, not a great ability since Pandora can only give one of them mobilization for free, so that it'd still be 4 mana to attack with the other two five fives, which would be, you know, the entire turn after you play this card. Definitely not what you want to be doing. However, there is the giant 2020 golem that requires you to sacrifice three of these golems, so that's kind of the most use you're going to get out of this card. So let's look at that. Is it okay to have that be a two-card combo? I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, it's it's fine to play this because you can immediately play the big guy after if you have no fear of severing wins. Uh, and even if you wait until next turn, you know, not a huge deal, but if you can actually get out the 20-20 the on turn 3 and pop one of their guys and then, you know, mobilize and attack with the next turn, you're going to be in a very advantageous position. I just don't know how often that's actually going to work out for you. Not only do you have to worry about severing wins and things of that nature, um, but it's just, uh, you know, it's it's a little weak. The, the golem is, you know, he's vulnerable, he can get heteroclite excalibur, he can get omitted, all, all of these kinds of things. So, it, it also comes down to how many of this card do you want to run in your golem deck, because I think four is not the correct answer. Um, you know, it, it's just, it really only combos with the big guy, you don't really want to play this card and just have it sit there. I don't know. I, I could see it as like a two or three of, maybe, probably a two of, if you're going to be playing a golem deck, but... I don't think I would want to run more than that, uh, unless you're completely all in on the uh, the get out the big golem, you don't fear severing wins, and you played like a win secluded on turn two. Then like, yeah, by all means, you know, play four of this card, but I don't know what color the golem deck would actually be. So overall, you know, not a terrible card. Um, it definitely has its place within the deck, which is more than I can say for some of these other cards. So overall, you know, not bad. Uh, crippling like this card, probably the best golem card, uh, because it is splashable. Uh, you know, obviously it's just another board wipe in white. Uh, it gives Makage that decks that were running Eternal Recurrence, especially. I, I think most people will agree that the standard for Makage has been red, white, black, um, because that gives you both Demon Flame and then it gives you like World of Madness, things like that. Uh, and then it gives you Crippling Light. So having two board wipes in that deck with between this and Eternal Recurrence is definitely something that the deck was, was looking for, uh, especially in a Fox-based meta where board wipes are really the only way to kind of stabilize against them. And then if you look at this in terms of the Golem deck, like, this is just an absolute blowout. Like, if you can get to this while you have out your guys, you have, like, Pandora flipped, and then just swing for game, like, absolutely amazing. There's a reason it's called Crippling Light. <laughs> uh, but seriously, um, definitely, definitely looking up for uh, control decks with this card coming out. Definitely one of the better cards of the set. Uh, being a super rare, absolutely earns that spot. Uh, so overall, a good card, which is, um, you know, we're two cards into the set, and I've already found two decent to good cards. It's better than most sets. Um, Discovery. Gain a gem of any attribute. Draw a card. Absolutely essential for the panda deck. Uh, definitely something you want to be running four of. Absolutely useless outside of the panda deck. Um, really not much else to say on the card. It's just a cantrip. Uh, sorry, that was Disco yeah, Discovery. That's what I said. Okay. Um, then we have Gem Beast. When it leaves the field, you gain a gem of any attribute. I'm not really a fan of the two mana six sixes that they printed within the archetypals of this set. For example, there, I know that there's the six six when it leaves the field, put a mystery counter on your ruler. Uh, it kind of runs into the problem that Red Riding Hood ran into in Fox decks, where it gets to the point where it's just too hard to kill it yourself. 
Although these things are 6-6s six as opposed to Riding Hood's 3-4, so it is vaguely threatening. You know, it's something that your opponent actually does have to answer. Uh, so these, these are a bit better in that regard. Although, obviously, their impact on death isn't nearly as high as Riding Hood's, no matter what deck you're playing, I would argue. Um, and overall, the, the gem deck isn't really hurting for ways to get gems. I don't actually think they'd end up playing this card. Uh, which, you know, if it's unplayable in everything except for one deck, and then I'm pretty sure it won't be played in that deck, you know, not a great card. Maybe like a 3 out of 10 kind of thing. Uh, just not not super useful. It just gets outclassed by other cards that you could be playing. So then we go on to Gemblade Emerald, uh, the 4 mana 8 8. When it enters your field, recover up to 4 target magic stones uh, You control if you control a wind gem. Not really a fan of this card. Uh, it reminds me a lot of... Um, it was the Mechanical Beast. It was a it was an 8-8 for 4 that cost 1 less for each machine you played, or you had in play. Um, generally, things that come in and untap your stones, not super impactful in Force of Will, uh, mostly because of Severing Winds. And you have to control a Wind Gem. There aren't a whole lot of other uses for Wind Gems, although you do want to get a variety of gems uh, on the field, so at some point you will have a Wind Gem. The other problem, though, is that the... You know, barring Severing Winds, you would play this card to leave mana open on your opponent's turn. And in white, you're not a very reactive deck. Uh, I mean, it's not useless, but for four mana, I definitely think that there are other things you would want to be playing. Um, not off the top of my head, because I don't know the set super well, but as we get further, you know, you'll see some, some panda cards you would like to play for four mana. Or maybe they're in the starter deck, I don't really remember. Uh, I didn't review the starter decks because they're, for the most part, not New Frontiers viable. So the cards that support them, you know, also not very new frontiers viable, but if you are going to run a panda deck, I still am not convinced you run this card. So overall, not very good. Uh, gem Minister Garnet, the 5-9, uh, when it enters the field, gain a gem of an any attribute and draw a card. This card you absolutely play in your panda deck. That does absolutely everything you want it to. You know, it draws a card, it gets a gem of any attribute, which is, uh, you know, there's not a lot of things that get any attribute. Some of them will just get light, things like that. Um, so overall, very good. It's... Overstatted on the defense, understated on the attack, but I really don't think your three drops are going to be what's closing out the game in a panda deck, so it's kind of whatever. Um, but in the context of the overall grand scheme of New Frontiers, when you look at like Makage, Persia, Fox, you know, pandas just absolutely do not compete. So I don't want you to think that like this card is good in New Frontiers, but it is good in the panda deck. Um, just, you know, more something to focus on. Uh, yeah, overall, you know, like solid, very solid. Gem Trader, when a card is entered, he'll gain a light gem. Uh, not not sold on this card. It, it only gets a light gem, uh, which is arguably one of the more useless ones. Uh, I would imagine the gems that you really want all are going to stem out of the five modal spell. So overall, pretty weak card. You know, just a three three. It's a one drop. Uh, for the most part, I want my one drops to draw a card or ramp mana. Uh, gaining a light gem is just a little mediocre. Not not sold on this card. Heavy arms panda. See, this is what you want to be doing for four mana. Is this eight eight? Um, that gets plus four, plus four, as long as you control three or more different uh, attributes among all the gems you control. So four mana, 12-12, obviously very overstated. Uh, it kind of closes out the game for the panda decks, plus there's the five drop that pulls a four drop out of your deck. I would absolutely want to pull this one out um, over the other guy, uh, just because I do value the four four stats more than untapping all of my gems. Uh, although, or untapping all my stones, sorry. Although I could see an argument for untapping all your stones if you are going to pull it out over the 5 drop, but if I were to draw one of them, I would want this card 100% of the time, so this is going to be the one that I want in my deck. Um, so yeah, over, I, I like this one a lot more than the other one. Jewel Bullet. Deal 400 damage to target non-panda resonator. If it was awakened, it deals 800 instead, and to awaken it, you banish a gem. Not a huge fan of this card. The 400 damage is pretty weak. 800 damage, not much better. Um, especially at the cost of a gem, which is the entire resource system of your deck. I feel like there's just other removal in white you could run, like, I don't know, Zero's Magic Light, for instance. Uh, so overall, not not sold on this card. Jewel Protection. This one's terrible. Um, it's, uh, it's the sorcery speed, give barrier, and prevent all damage. Which is really, you know, you don't want that to be sorcery speed. But it does give you a gem of any attribute, so... Because it's not mandatory to banish a gem, so you could just play this as a one mana get a gem. Although, uh, there are probably better ways to do that. So overall, I don't think this card would make the cut in a banded deck either. Jewel Shield, uh, the same as Jewel Sword. They both um, give either plus 200 attack or defense, respectively. And then you gain a gem of any attribute, and then, you know, they gain plus one for each attribute among all gems you control. 
So for the most part, you're going to be giving plus seven attack or plus seven defense if you are maxed out on your gems, um, which is okay uh, because it does give you a gem of an attribute as well. Uh, pretty low impact card as far as the grand scheme of things of New Frontiers, but if you're running a panda deck in New Frontiers, I don't think you really care about the grand scheme of things. So I could see Jewel Sword being run, but not Jewel Shield. Uh, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the three mana three eight jeweler of Sasaru Palace, uh, banish light gem, gain a gem of any attribute. I don't like this card. It, you know, it cycles your light gems, but I don't really want to be running light gem production. I want to be running any gem production, so cycling my light gems isn't something I value, especially in the three job slot. This thing competes with the five nine that gains a gem of any attribute and draws a card, and in that aspect, it's just completely outclassed. So overall, I don't think this card would even make the cut in a panda deck. Uh, Light of Transmigration, Remnant, uh, Remove Target. It's a flicker ability um, with Remnant for 2 mana, non-sorcery speed. The fact, or non-instant speed, sorry. The fact that this card is just chance speed, I don't like it. Um, you know, usually you want these effects to dodge removal, and if it can't do that, then it's pretty useless. Sure, you get a flicker, things like Captain Hook, um, but you're probably running that in Lumia anyway, because if you're playing white and then you're running anything worth flickering, you're probably just playing Lumia. Um, although between this and Faley, you know, you suddenly have, uh, the way to build a Lumia deck without playing Lumia, and you can only do it in Lumia colors. So, overall not sold on this card, I, I think it's pretty low impact. Uh, if you are running Fox and Wanderer, you're just playing Dreams of Juliet over this card anyway. Uh, so overall, not, not a fan. Magic Light Warrior, just a 6-6 six, six Golem with Mobilize 1, obviously terrible in the grand scheme of New Frontiers, and then pretty much the bread and oops, pretty much the bread and butter of your uh, Pandora Golem deck, just because you do need little guys in there to shit out and then wipe your opponent's board and kill them. Magic Shield Warrior, I don't think you would play this one, just because it's a 0 I don't know how relevant the blocking is. I feel like you could just play Fogs and have a better time, although maybe you do need to get your Golem count up. Uh, just because Pandora does cost, uh, or does require you to have three golems to flip, uh, you know, you do need to build up a board a little bit. So maybe this card makes the cut. I'm not really looking at golems as a new Frontiers viable deck. And then we move on to Magic Sword Warrior, the 8 6 with the first strike, mobilize one. I actually don't mind this one. Uh, it kind of sucks that he doesn't have, like, target attack, or precision rather. Um, and he's an 8 6, so he dies on the backswing to a lot of other two drops. But. At that point, you're kind of two for one in your opponent if you get to attack this into one and then uh, they trade one back into it or something along those lines. Um, but overall, in New Frontiers, this thing dies to Shade, which isn't really a fair thing to say, like, oh, this card's bad because it dies to Shade, because every two drop dies to Shade. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you can't just play, like, that doesn't mean you don't play them and just let your opponent, like, have a Shade on field for the rest of the game because you're too afraid to play anything into it. Uh, but I definitely think this is something you would play in your Golem deck. Uh, and then we move on to Orphica, Dancer in the White Mist. Uh, pandas you control get plus two, plus two. When it enters your field, you remove another target resonator from the game, and then at the next end of the turn, you put it into play. Uh, and then when it's put into your graveyard from a field, uh, you search your deck for a panda and add it to your hand. Overall, um, whoops, not a bad card. The flicker ability is interesting. Uh, I do like the, I don't remember what it's called, but it was a red-white three-drop that flickered something immediately. Uh, and then Orphica doing that in just white, is definitely not something I'm mad about. Uh, I'm not sure how much actual place on Chelsea. I can't really think of a deck that she fits into. Um, just because, for the most part, white is a color that you still run in Lumia. So, you know, anything that you could flicker, you're just going to flicker with Lumia. And she puts back in Unrested, so I don't know. You're just kind of. I don't know, you're not really facilitating your Lumia strategy. Uh, it could be a dead draw later in the game. Like, this is a bit of a win more card. Pretty much any flicker ability is a win more thing, uh, which is why Lumia is so good, because she does it for free at all stages of the game, so you get a flicker like Birds and Thomas in the early game. But cards that actually cost mana that flicker things, generally not as good, uh, less impactful, dead in the late game, unless you're already winning. Uh, and then they kind of, like, supersede your win condition. Or not supersede, sorry, like, uh, super accelerate your win condition, is what I was meaning to say. Uh, but the point still stands, you know, you're, unless you've already got out of Captain Hook or something, this card's not good. If you do have out of Captain Hook, that means you're probably playing Lumia, and then this card is not relevant. Um, but if, you know, we do, down the line, get a, a deck that is very pseudo-Lumia, but doesn't want to play Lumia for whatever reason, I could see this card seeing play.
And then obviously very good in your Panda deck. Uh, Panda Acrobat. This is the card I was talking about. Nope, no it's not. Uh, <laughs> this is just a 12-12 that uh, Banish a Gem, Rest a Resonator on entry. Overall, not amazing. It doesn't have any symbol skills, and it's a 5-drop, and it's a 12-12. Um, so I don't even know if you could play this card in your Panda deck. It's it's a little mediocre in what it does. Um, yeah, Just New Frontiers, not a viable card. Pandora. So Pandora, you know, Judgment 1, only if you control 3 Golems, Energize for 1. And then her uh, hair ornament lets her mobilize a Golem for 0 once per turn during either player's turn. That last part's really important because... Uh, it mobilizes things to block as well, uh, which is one of the more annoying parts, is that you feel a little constrained with your mana. Do I attack? Do I block? You don't really, you know, get to do both. But with Pandora, you do. Uh, so overall, not sure how she's going to, you know, size up in New Frontiers. It depends on how impactful a one-sided board wipe actually ends up being. Uh, and then her J-Ruler side, all your golems are mobilized. Any time a golem would take damage, uh, it goes to her instead, which is pretty relevant because she's 1020. And then... Uh, so the big thing to notice is that Hair Ornament of Light, uh, as far as I can tell, is not a God's Art, and is therefore not once per game. Um, so for 4 mana, you know, your golems you control get plus 4, plus 4 until end of turn. Uh, so really, she's just trying to set up a board, and then one-shot you with a bunch of golems. Which is not a strategy I'm mad at, definitely not something that I think is currently viable in New Frontiers, with Fox and Makagi and all that running around. Uh, the it's just a little bit too efficient for people to remove your uh, your golems. It's just, uh, you know, and then, like, it, you're not really going to get over Fox's board unless you can get to the board wipe, but all your early drops die to shade, and, you know, your big guy gets stopped by Abdul, but, you know, if someone can find the right build for it, the right color combination, I... Uh, I think it could be something down the line potentially, but at the moment I really am not seeing a whole lot of value in it. Going to Profitable Transaction, this is what I was talking about, it's the 5 modal spell. Um, so the Light Gem is tar Rest Target Resonator, the Fire Gem is Deal 6 to a Resonator, uh, Water Gem draw or, oh, Water Gem is Return Target Resonator to its owner's hand, Wind is Draw a Card, and Darkness is d your opponent discards card. So really you want to be getting um, Wind fire and darkness, which is why I was talking about the light gem producers not being very impactful. Uh, the water one is also not bad, but white is easily the worst out of the five, uh, which is why you don't want light gems to be produced in your deck. Uh, the instant speed discard is what um, really kind of sells me on this card. Uh, this is like the only reason I think pandas would ever have something of a chance in New Frontiers, but uh, at the moment I definitely don't think it can compete with Fox even with a card like this. But definitely something to look out for. This is what like makes it a deck. Reduction. Quick cast target resonator becomes a zero one. Uh definitely not mad at this card. Um you know, it, it doesn't take away the abilities of the card, but in something like Makage where you can just ping something and then reduction it, it's a three mana removal spell. Uh it's probably not as worth it as Endless Knight at that point is the only problem I have. Um however you can like reduction before untaps if you had two open mana and then, you know, uh, ping it, or you can, you know, ping something going into, like, turn one, you call stone pass, turn two, you ping, untap, call stone, reduction, and that kind of makes it more of an early game three mana removal spell, which I don't hate. Uh, I'm just not sure if it's going to be something that you end up playing over something like Endless Night. I'm not sure that there's a deck out there that is so uh, blitz aggro you out that you need to be playing three mana removal spells on turn two in order to survive. Uh, especially when you just have, like, Demon Flame and Lethal Arrow and things like that. But if you're not running red, I definitely think you end up running Reduction as kind of your replacement for Demon Flame to not get zerged out of the game while you're building up uh, your resources. Sacred Temple of Light. At end of turn, if you don't control a Resonator, you may banish this card if you do search your deck for a Golem and put it into the field. Uh, this card's, like, okay. It very obviously is only going to grab... Um, what's it called? Uh, the, the, the big 2020 guy. Um, nothing else is really worth grabbing, especially for 4 mana, and even for 4 mana, I'm not 100% sure he's, so, like, good for grabbing, especially because you do have to control 0 resonators. Um, and you probably want to be doing that with your early turns, is setting up your low drop resonators. So, overall, it doesn't really fit the theme of the deck, it's kind of like an oh shit button, but it, it, at the point you hit this oh shit button, I think it might be too late for you. So, overall, not a fan. Um, this is the guy I was talking about. Uh, Shin Shin, Rei Rei, Shin Shin and Rei Rei Acrobatic Twins. Uh, when this card enters your field, you may banish two light gems if you do search your deck for a panda and put it into the field, then shuffle your deck. 
Uh, the, this is like the where things get wonky is because this card needs light gems. I thought it was any attribute, if we're being honest. Um, but this card needs light gems, and because it needs light gems, you need to produce light gems because this is kind of your win condition. Uh, it could even pull out another copy of itself. So if you like hard ramp light gems, then you can um you know play this guy, banish two light gems, get another one, banish two more, get another one, banish two more, get another one, banish two more, and then like get a four drop, probably the uh. The 12 12, or you could even get the one that untaps all your stones uh, if you still have a wind gem left. Uh, so, overall, this is like the big win condition of pandas. Uh, obviously, you know, 10 10 no symbol skills makes it pretty uh, unplayable in actual new frontiers uh, because this is like, you know, this competes with Captain Hook. You know, same stat line, same mana cost, uh, infinitely less impactful. Uh, so, you know, not super sold. Uh, this would be like something good to flicker with the. The, the uh, two drop that pumps all your pandas. Uh, but, you know, that's just, it's like a fringe locals kind of deck. It's not actually going to see play at like Masters or anything like that. Uh, or any of the GPs coming up. Then we have Summon Magic Warriors. I actually like this card a lot. Uh, you look at the top seven cards of your deck, put up to two golems with a combined total cost of five or less among them into your field, and put the rest on the bottom of your deck in a random order. Uh, the random order part is actually, this is the one sideline I will say into draft, is the random order part is actually really important for draft because your deck size is so small if you played like two of this card. It's an uncommon, it's not unreasonable to get to. Uh, you could just arrange the entire order of your deck. Uh, so it is good that they put random order. But then, you know, a new frontier is, uh, you know, pretty pretty good for your golem deck. Definitely would say you're on this card. Uh, just don't know how impactful golems actually are in new frontiers. So on the fence about this card, not super great. Um, this is the guy I've been talking about, Ultimate Magic Warrior Gear Atmos. Uh, mobilize 3, banish 3 golems rather than pay his cost, and when he enters the field, destroy target resonator your opponent controls. Uh, now this guy's kind of a house. This is kind of your big baddie. This is what the golems uh, aspire to be. This is their big win condition, and it's a very good win condition. The only problem I have is no symbol skills on a creature that costs this much mana, and no... Um, no evasion, no barrier, nothing like that. No, uh, nothing to. N he doesn't like get any advantage out outside of popping your opponent's resonator. Once he's on field, he doesn't actually do anything. He doesn't threaten anything. Although you can get him out relatively early, which is why you know I don't think he's a terrible card. Uh, not really much else to say about him. Just a, a very solid win condition for golems. Pretty much unplayable in anything else. Uh, so however viable you think Golems is, is how viable you think this card is. Uh, White Cat Asarsu, when it enters, or when it's put into a graveyard from the field, gain a gem of any attribute. I like this more than the 1-drop 3-3, three, three. Um, just because, like, 300 attack doesn't really matter. You're not trading with any, any other 1-drops in the game at that point. And then this one gains a gem of any attribute, although you do, once again, run into that problem of uh, I don't know how to kill my own cards kind of thing. White Raven, uh, when it enters the field, banish gem, draw a card. Uh, unplayable in New Frontiers. It's like it's a one mana flyer that draws a card, but you have to sacrifice one of the resources for your deck. Um, and if you do that turn one, then like suddenly you're out of gems. And it's I don't know. There's there's this weird balancing of like uh, sacrificing gems versus um, you know uh, cards that gain them. And I really think you want to be using all of your gems for either the five drop that sacks two light gems to put it into play, or for the five drop modal spell. So. I don't think White Raven is something you really want to be spending your gems on. Uh, you know, just play green and play Tama. Uh, although I'm not sure green's the best splash for that deck. I don't know anything about pandas and new frontiers. Um, but you know, overall, not not doing what the deck wants to do as far as I can tell. And we have Wing Ruler Panda. Uh, it gains flying as long as you control a water gem, but it's only a 6-12 and it's a 4-drop. Really bad in my opinion. Uh, you need to be aggressive with your pandas, and a 600 attack just isn't going to cut it. Alright, so on to the red cards of the set. First off, we have Apprentice, Apprentice Beast Tamer. Uh, when it enters the field, uh, target beast gets plus 4, plus 4, and swiftness until end of turn. Uh, overall, a pretty weak card, all things considered. It's a little understated. A lot of the good beasts rotated out with Alice Cluster, and mostly the big thing is that this is a 
a pump ability that gives something swiftness, but it costs three mana. If I'm going to give something swiftness and have it be relevant, I, I kind of need it to cost one or two mana. Even two is kind of a stretch. Overall, this is more or less a worse version of the uh, one cost spell that we'll see a little bit later with Remnant that gives something plus two, plus two in swiftness. So overall, pretty mediocre card. Don't really think it's going to see play in anything new frontiers wise. Uh, Archaeoteryx, I have no idea how to pronounce it. It's 4 mana 8 8 with flying and first strike. Now, you've heard me talking a little bit about bombs and talking about their lack of symbol skills, and this thing here has two symbol skills. That, however, does not make it a good card. If it had Swiftness Flying First Strike, I actually probably still wouldn't like it that much as a card, because uh, as a 4-drop, you're competing with Mariabella in aggro decks, because I do think Prissia is probably going to stay the the, uh, the aggro ruler over um, the new lizard guy. I actually don't remember his name. Uh, the Strength Counter Ruler, you know who I'm talking about. Um, and this also competes with the uh, Kame, the demon that we'll see a little bit later. And overall, just not making the cut stat-wise. Uh, also, the fact that it it is a vanilla outside of its symbol skills. Symbol skills are cool, but they're not enough. You need to have an ability as well. Uh, Beast Den on Mount Hoel. Uh, Dragonoids you control get plus two, plus two, and you can pay two and banish it and search your deck for a Dragonoid and put it into your hand. For the most part, I don't think we've ever seen a pumping field spell, or addition, rather. Sorry the Yu-Gi-Oh coming out. Uh, we've never seen an addition that pumps your board be relevant. We've seen World of Madness be fringe relevant, but it was never like meta-defining. And I really don't think this thing is going to uh, really start that trend of additions that pump certain creatures on your board being relevant. Uh, and the search is mostly, you know, Dragonoids, eh, uh, it's a little awkward here because Dragonoids were originally a white-blue sort of archetype. And we've even seen a few black dragonoids, and now to put the dragonoids in red just makes us a little bit all over the place when we don't have a ruler that fixes colors for dragonoids. So overall, not a fan of this card either. Burning Awakening. Uh, two mana, quick cast, put, an, uh, put a thousand thousand on a resonator until end of turn. Or J resonator, rather. But you have to remove five strength counters from your J ruler, so obviously you have to be playing the strength counter ruler. Unless you're playing strength counter support in Prisio, which I... I'm going to say this now, I don't recommend playing Strength Counter Support in Prissia. Uh, so, and it's also a Battle Arts, which uh, I believe he... I know there's some kind of support that like puts your Battle Arts back in your hand from your grave. I think it's one of the structured cards, though. Um, but overall, you know, 2 mana for a 10-10 is a, is, a is a pretty massive pump, but uh, you could just play Reforth's Wall of Flame and do it at end of your opponent's turn. And that's probably going to be a bit better for you because you aren't locked into a specific ruler. So overall, I think it's a worse version of that card. Demon Watcher, uh, five mana, eight six with flying, and when it's put into a graveyard, it deals six hundred to a resonator. I don't think I have to explain why this card's absolutely terrible. Um, but in case I do, it's understated. Uh, the damage that it does is mostly irrelevant uh, when you look at the the fact that this is a five drop. Uh, the flying, not super threatening on an 8-6, considering it dies to shade. Like, if, it, if it's a 5-drop that dies to... I was talking about how it's not fair to judge 2-drops because they all die to shade, and now you have a 5-drop that dies to shade? Are you serious? Um, so yeah, as far as New Frontiers goes, card's completely unplayable in anything. Devil's Advocate. Uh, recover target resonator, gain control of it until end of turn, gain swiftness until end of turn. Uh, I kind of wish this card was a uh, quick cast. And not not so that I can play it on my opponent's turn, but more so that I could play it before my own recovery phase. Uh, because really, I can't... I really can't think of anything that I would like to pay 5 mana to steal from you. Because if I try to... Like, the biggest, the biggest resonators in the game are Chimeras. And if I try to take a Chimera, chances are you're going to make a Chimera with it. And I'm not going to get any value out of this 5 mana spell. Um... And with the with Seal of Wind and Light being gone, I think Millennia Bond pops up in a few more places, so I really don't like something like this. Dino Rush, target resonator you control deals damage to its, equal to its attack to another target resonator. This is the errated version, so this is the actual text of the card now. Um, overall, not a huge fan of this. Uh, I do think it's a little bit better than Battle for Adoractia was, uh, even though Battle for Adoractia had Remnant, because now you just get to punch something instead of fighting something. Um, but still, you know, red's not really hurting for removal like that. You could, um, you could play like burn. This this fills the same spot as like burn to cinders. 
that's actually all I can think of in a two drop red removal spot, but uh, you're most likely playing Prissia, and that means your biggest creature or J ruler is a 10 10, unless you're playing um, Giant, uh, in which case you get a 17 17. But if you already have Giant on the field, I really don't think you need Dino Rush to close out a game, and I really don't think the 10 10 shoot on something is going to be. Uh, much more impactful than a 700 damage from Burn Descenders. So, not a fan of Dino Rush Dragon Call. Uh, one mana search your deck for a Dragon, Dragonoid, or Dinosaur. Reveal it and put it in your hand. There just aren't really any impactful Dragons, Dragonoids, or Dinosaurs, so I can't imagine what deck you would Well, I can imagine you would play this in a Dragon, Dragonoid, or Dinosaur tribal deck, but uh, not a fan of this card. Dragonoid Martial Artist, uh, five mana, fourteen eight. Obviously, really bad, but you know this is more. This is one of those cards that's like a draft card, not a New Frontiers card. So uh, I'm just gonna kind of skip over it. It's a vanilla. There's not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, flying when this card, or Environmental Research Fabre, Fabra, Fab, Fabio, um, Environmental Researcher Fabio. Uh, when this card enters your field, put a ten ten Fire Dragon Hogan Resonator with flying into the field. So, um. I almost like this card. It could have had some cool fringe play in like uh, bad Lumia decks, but the fact that it's a four-four means it really dies to everything. They could just like Mikage could just demon flame this without having to ping it first. So a five drop that dies to a one mana removal spell and all it does is make it ten ten. You're basically playing five mana just for the ten ten. This thing probably isn't going to get to like survive long enough to to flicker it or anything like that. Um, would have needed to be like a seven seven. That makes a 10 10, and I still think that card would have been like okay at best. But once again, it's a 5 drop that dies to shade, and sure, you get the 10 10 left over, but a 10 10 is not a 12 12. And that's what you need to be when you fly. Eruptifant. Uh, Beast you control have swiftness, and uh, whenever another resonator you attack on you control attacks, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So this is pretty good for the, the aggro decks that want to go really wide. Um, which I really don't think aggro decks are trying to do right now, if we're being totally honest. And a lot of the beasts are rotated out, so unfortunately red-green beasts not really a deck in New Frontiers uh, as much as it used to be. Although I think even back then it was mono-green beasts. So, you know, overall you just, you're just you not finding an aggro deck that's going to go wide, and the, the beasts you control getting swiftness isn't super relevant. I mean, sure, that means that he gets swiftness. So, you know, 3 mana, 7-7 seven, seven with swiftness, I'm not mad at. Uh, I just don't think it's going to really find its way into decks, especially for a triple red, because it means you can't play it on turn two with Prissia if you play a Sacred Elf turn one. Explorer of Mount Hoel. Uh, when she enters the field, uh, reveal the top card of your deck if it's a chant, put it into your hand. A little a little strange here. Uh, this actually probably goes into like soul decks and things of, of that nature, uh, because it is in the red, blue, ancient magic colors, and those are the only decks I can really think of where you're playing a significant number of chants more than you are resonators. And, uh, you know, th this kind of card would be good in that, but not really not really going to put Soul over the top, not really going to make it a meta contender with things like Fox and Prissia. And the 7-5 stats, I would have preferred it as a 5-7. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been talking a lot about Shade. Uh, my thing of a few sets ago was one drop, or things that die to Tama, not good. Now things that die to Shade, not great. Uh, although it's, it's, you know, a, a two drop isn't bad because it dies to Shade. A two drop is bad because it dies to Tama, uh, such as um, Birds of Paradise, which is why you're probably not going to see that replacing the Avatar builds of Fox. Uh, 200 defense is just too low. Um, but this card, I could, I could actually see it in, in Soul decks and things like that. Anything that runs a significant more number of uh, chants than Resonators. I could even see this uh, potentially in like Makage decks that are running you know, a very low Resonator count, but probably not. Anyway, th this cards it's a good card. Uh, it's just a matter of if it can find a home. Fiendfire, the more I look at this card uh, and do the math on it, the more I'm just really not a fan of it. Uh, four mana deals 600 to a resonator or your opponent's face. You know, it's it's definitely cheaper than Steam Explosion. The difference, though, is that if you are playing Steam Explosion, you are most likely uh, a mana counter deck, uh, a deck with mana such as Soul or Alhamot. So you, you kind of offset that cost by paying it in mana counters. You can't do that here. And the... Um, 
It actually is a lot less damage than Schrodinger's observation, either to a resonator or to a face. The fall off is just pretty significant. For example, here, if I pay three mana, it's 400 damage. If I pay three mana on observation, it would be 400 to a resonator, 300 to face. So as soon as we get one mana past that, you know, any time that cards start to be relevant and do a relevant amount of damage, for example, four mana, four mana on this is 600 damage, four mana on Schrodinger's observation is also 400 damage, or 600 damage, sorry, and that's to face, it's 800 to a resonator. So uh, observation really just starts to outvalue this card very quickly. And sure, you know, you could make the argument, oh, you know, this is in red instead of black white, but I, I really don't see what kind of red deck you would be running that wants to do this instead. Uh, maybe a Makage deck, and then, you know, you're paying the black, so you always get that much life back. But if you're playing red, black, Makage, there's a good chance that your third color is white. Although if you're playing red, black, green, Makage, then sure, I could see an argument for this card, but I personally don't think I would run it. I just think the payoff's not big enough. Fire Dragon's a can attack or block uh, when it's put into a graveyard. Put a 10-10 Fire Dragon Resonator with flying into the field. You know, once again, 10-10 Flyer is just not good enough, especially when they're not coming out that quickly. Uh, Refart's Wall of Fame is a good 10-10 Flyer because it comes out at instant speed and is 2 mana. This card is 4 mana, then you have to find a way to kill it because it can't attack or block. So probably like World of Madness, maybe a, a Makage ping, something like that. Uh, things like this are okay in Hearthstone, where you can give minions taunt, but obviously Force of Will doesn't have a mechanic like that, and since it can't block, you know, just not, not really going to see play anywhere. Flame Style deals 700 damage to each Resonator. I don't like this card. I think it's a little bit too much mana. Uh, you know, Flame King Shout wasn't being played as a 3 mana deal 400 to your opponent's board. So this is a two-sided board wipe. Uh, for pretty much all three drops, you know, unless you're playing an 8-8, but I actually can't think of any three drops that are being played at the moment. Um, I like Big Abdul, but Big Abdul is a 7-8, so this doesn't hit that, so there goes your one example. So overall, I think of a very weak card, not something you're going to see in anything. Then we have Flying Drill, deals 1,000 damage to target resonator with flying, and 1,000 damage to up to second target without flying if it was awakened, and you have to remove three strength counters from your J Ruler. So, uh, you know, 1,000 damage to target resonator with flying. For the most part, in New Frontiers, if there is a flyer on board, it's Griffin, it's a 12 12. 1,000 damage does not make the cutoff. I don't know why Force Will keeps printing 12 12 flyers in green and black, and then giving you 10 10 flyer, or 10, 10, 10 flyers in red. Uh, you know, red's really getting the short end of the stick here which personally I'm fine with. I've never been a, a huge fan of uh, red decks in general. Uh, I say as I've won a Grand Prix with a red deck, but <laughs> um, you know, I, I really think red is getting kind of shafted here, uh, especially with this kind of stuff that's like a thousand damage to a, a, a resonator flying. Like, sure, you're going to be able to kill red's 10-10 flyers, but you can't kill the relevant griffin. Uh, you can kill manticore, but like if they're, if they're manticoring against a red deck, you've already lost the game. Food Supply, put 5 strength counters on your J-Roll or draw a card. Once again, just a cantrip, does what your deck wants it to. Obviously a very good card if you are playing the uh, the Red Dragon Ruler. If not, I don't think I would play this card. Gourmet Chef, Sherry Shara. Uh, when into the field, you put 10 strength counters on your J-Roller. Uh, I believe every um, archetype has has their big 10-10 that like puts counters on their guy. Uh, this one, you know, it's okay. It's probably one of the better ones because you can um, tap to reset uh, you do to 10 and then put this on get up to 20 that's a lot of counters especially if you flip you can rapid fire them off deal 20 to something then go back up to 15 but that's a pretty fringe scenario the fact that it doesn't do anything while it's on the field doesn't have any symbol cells and uh, not a very great card Hellflame this is a great card uh, as an additional cost to this card you remove X strength counters from your J ruler and it deals X damage to target J resonator I could see this um, as like a very good removal spell for one, the early game, two, uh, after you flipped your ruler and then it's died and you're back down to like resetting the 10 at most. Um, and obviously this card's very good in draft. This is another little caveat, like obviously this is an example of a card that's like phenomenal in draft and then like really mediocre in New Frontiers. Uh, just because you have to be playing the, the red ruler to do this and I don't think the red ruler is really going to make the cut in the current meta, and I, I really don't see Fox going anywhere anytime soon, so when you cap out at 10 damage, uh, because you can only reset yourself up to 10, there's not a whole lot to put strength counters on. Um, you know, this, this kind of is a little weak, 
because if you're above 10, like if you're at 15, and you're if you're going to be at 12, you're probably at 15, and then you could just flip your ruler and shotgun off the counters. You don't need to play a card to do it. High speed. Uh, I, I do like this card. Target has an inner gains plus two, plus two, and swiftness until end of turn. And if you remove strength counters from your J roller, it deals 400 damage to your opponent. And it has remnant, which means if you play four of this card and you play four of the. Um, sorry, if you play four of this card and you play the red ruler, then you could deal a potential 800 to 3200 damage to your opponent over the course of the game just with this one card. And that's on top of the resonator that they're giving swiftness, hitting you in the face. Uh. I do find it a little... Uh, I actually don't find it strange at all that this card isn't quick cast. Then it'd be like too good of a burn spell. Obviously I really don't need to get things swiftness at instant speed. That'd be a little weird. A little opposite of what swiftness wants to be doing. So overall, a pretty good card. I think this might end up finding play uh, nowhere. Actually, Prissia just calls a stone to give things swiftness. It doesn't need to play this. If the red dragon is going to... or if the red ruler is going to make an impact on the meta though, I definitely think this card will be in the deck. Hole pig. Uh, sorry guys, the pig isn't good. Uh, Venus's card recovery ruler. It's just, um, I mean, it doesn't die to Tama, which is actually really good for a one drop. If you can play this turn one, like sure, you're in a pretty good spot. Anytime that it would get removed, you can just untap your ruler. The problem is that you probably haven't, like if you play this turn one, and then, you know, you attack with it turn two, and then they go to like remove it with something, you probably haven't removed any strength counters from your ruler yet. So the ability to untap your ruler to reset your strength counters to 10 is irrelevant because you have not removed any yet. You're already sitting at 10. And in the late game, I really don't want to draw a one drop that says, you know, recover my ruler. Uh, it's probably better in other strategies. Uh, I do think I like this more in uh, Raya because she just adds a counter. She doesn't set herself back up to a certain number. Um, so if you're playing like Black Red Raya, like I could see Hoel pick, but for the most part, Flute's Dragon is just a better card. Just getting a Resonator to call a stone for your ruler instead of, you know, recovering your ruler. It's a little bit better, especially because Flute's Dragon gets up to a 5-9 once you have 5 stones. So, Hoel Pig, just a little bit outclassed there. Then we have Hoel Saurus, uh, when it enters the field, deals 300 damage to target J Resonator. Uh, if it did 400, it would still be irrelevant because Shade would just kill it in response. Uh, <laughs> It is a dinosaur, though. It is a 2 mana 6 6. It does meet the vanilla standard. It's just, it's really low impact for the kinds of things that you're going to be doing in New Frontiers. Um, although it's not irrelevant that this comes in and kills Sacred Elf. That's definitely something to keep in mind, uh, you know, going forward. If, you know, some kind of red control ish deck comes out, it's a really, like, fringe meta scenario, but it does remove something relevant. That's worth noting. Here we go. Came Demon of Vice. Uh, is this card's a lot like um, I was gonna say a little red, but it's it's really not. It, it's very a very unique card that we haven't really seen before. So when enters the field, you recover target resonator with total cost two or less. Your opponent controls, and you gain control of it, and it gains swiftness. Whenever resonators you can, whenever a resonator you control attacks, uh, Came deals two hundred damage to your opponent, and then you can pay red and banish your resonator, and Came gains swiftness until end of turn. So obviously, ideally, you play this card on turn five. You know, it's a, then it's a 5 mana 10 10, but it eats one of your opponent's guys, attacks with it, deals 200 to your opponent, then sacrifices their resonator to give Kame Swiftness attack, deal another 200 to your opponent. It's just a lot of surprise burst damage, and it's something I could see competing with uh, Mariabella for that 4 drop slot in Prissia, but I definitely think this would be better in like a mid rangey, control y type um, red deck, which I just don't think we really have. But we shall see. I don't like that it gets shut off by Abdul either, because that is like the prime two drop that you want to be getting off the field. So we'll see if Kame ends up going anywhere. Master of Faithful Beasts. Three mana, seven, seven. When it enters the field, you search your deck for a beast, put it into your hand. You know, not any relevant beasts that are really running around. This card's definitely better in draft, uh, where they're, you know, the set does have beasts in it, so. There it's relevant, but in New Frontiers there really aren't any impactful beasts that you're going to see. Let's actually take a look real quick at the beasts that exist in New Frontiers. And I'll show you what I'm talking about, just so I can give you guys kind of a baseline of why this card isn't that good. So we have that guy, or that guy. You know, you see the ones from the new sets, nothing's really sticking out as super, uh, super impactful. We get into the old stuff that we had, it's like, you know, the Yigdor Wolf, uh, Fox Spirit, 
Sprinting Flame Horse. Sprinting Flame Horse is actually not an irrelevant search target. Um, you know, Fiery Fox Reincarnation, uh, Messenger of Lilius Petal, uh, although I'd be very surprised if you're playing this and Messenger in the same deck. Uh, you know, Bird's Paradise, I was talking about earlier, is a bad card. Um, Zero's Familiar, if you're running like a red-white zero deck, I don't think you would play this card, actually. It's just too much mana. I don't think you really get to three mana in red-white zero. And if you do, like, I don't think this is the card you're casting. But, you know, searching, uh, fl spending Flame Horse and Fiery Fox, probably the most valuable things to get off of this card. Uh, Mad Boar of Mount Howell, not a, not a bad target either. But, you know, nothing super impactful. Nothing that's going to curve out really well, considering this is a 3-drop. There's no, like, 4-drop beast that you're going to search and just curve into really nicely. Even these two cost 5 mana, so it's just a little bit too much there. Yeah, uh, curve into... Are, are there actually no 4-drop beasts that you could curve into with this card? 5, 5, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 5, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1... Yeah, there are actually no 4-drop beasts in New Frontiers to curve into. That's amazing. Sorry, Master of Faithful Beasts. You get the short end of the stick this set. Red Cap. Uh, I don't like this card. A lot of people have called it the new Ruck Egg. Uh, you know, it's self-replacing, but it has swiftness. And the problem is, like, I'm... It's self-replacing, but, like, it's self-replacing into a shitty 1-drop. Like, 200 damage is not impactful, really. Uh, you know... R Ruck Egg was in like a league of its own because Ruck Egg turned into like a 5 5 under Cathuga. Um, and then you gotta search another Ruck Egg. And Ruck Egg like sat menacingly on the field as something you don't really want to kill. But Red Cap gets the. Um, yeah, it gets it on Graveyard Entry 2. I don't know. You, like it, it's possible that they'll just leave this thing while you constantly attack with it. And then you just draw one of your red caps, and that feels terrible. Like, I never want to draw two of this card. Drawing two Ruck Egg was, like, fine, because I would search a different Resonator with the first one. And then the second one would just search another Ruck Egg. And I could just keep the train going. Red Cap being locked into itself on such a tiny body is just uh, not not a good card. Stone-Tongued Basilisk, whenever this card attacks, it gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. So it doesn't meet the vanilla standard of stats, but it does become an 8-5. So you overcompensate for that attack by giving up 100 defense. But, you know, because it's only doing that when it attacks, if this was like an 8-5, if this was just a vanilla 8-5, it would be better than, you know, if it had this shitty line of text. And even then, I still don't think it would see play uh, because it doesn't have swiftness. But, you know, at least then, like, things like Big Abdul would have to trade with it when they attacked into it, but... I don't know. It's just, it, if this card was an 8-5, I, I almost feel like I could talk about it, but because it's not, like, it's just really mediocre. Two-Horned Ala Mirage. Uh, when it enters the field, it deals 500 damage to you. If it had flying, I'd like it. I wouldn't like it a whole lot, but I'd like it, because as it stands, I just do not like this card at all. 500 damage to your own face obviously doesn't feel super relevant, but 5-5s five are just kind of irrelevant. And then if you play this card any time past turn 1, it's it's just completely useless. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't stand up well. Vanish in Fire. So as an additional cost to play this card, you remove any number of strength counters from your J Ruler. Then it deals X damage to each resonator your opponent controls, where X is the strength counters removed and anything that it kills goes to the remove from the game area instead of the graveyard. So it's a one-sided board wipe that could deal up to a thousand damage, but it costs five mana, and five mana is the, you know, the cutoff for every board wipe, and because you really can't, this is the problem you run into again, because the red ruler resets himself at ten, and it's very difficult to go above that, uh, you're pretty much going to be dealing 10 to your opponent's board, which you look at Flame King Shout, um, let you deal 400 for 3 mana and put a 3 drop into play so you don't lose out on Curvature. Uh, Vanish and Fire really doesn't do that. You can deal 10 to the opponent's board, even if you deal you know, 12 to the opponent's board and you actually get the Griffins out of there, they can respond by making a an Omit, killing one of your guys, even killing itself, just to, you know, get some kind of value out of it. And if they gain, if you pay 5 mana to clear your opponent's board, and they gain 1500 life, then either you've wasted your turn, or you had a board and you played this to get through them and go for game, in which case they make an Omit, eat one of your guys, and then still have a blocker for another one of your Resonators. And if you, if you can manage to go the full 15, then, like, your ruler's probably flipped. 
uh, and I guess then you're in a pretty good spot, but getting to five mana and having your flipped ruler really seems like too high a curve for what the deck wants to be doing. And if you flipped your ruler and then it immediately died somehow without shooting off any of the counters, and that's how you've got 15 on your ruler side, then like I guess you're living in magical Christmas land. I guess you're probably still going to lose to Fox. Um, just, I, I don't see the deck being able to push through enough damage leading up to this card. You know, your first few turns, you're not getting a whole lot of value. There's not a lot of Swiftness Resonators left in New Frontiers. You're probably playing like Sylvia, so maybe you've gotten in like 6, 12, 1800 damage at absolute most before you flip your ruler. And for Prissia, that's death range if they don't have a griffin because, you know, you're sprinting flame horse, you attack for 24 in the air. Uh, whereas with the, you know, what is, alright, I have to look up the ruler's name because I'm tired of just calling this guy the red ruler. I need you guys to know exactly who I'm talking about. Martial artist pillow. No, this is the draft ruler. There we go. Kirik. Kirik Rarik. Yeah, he doesn't have swiftness. That's what I thought. Um, yeah, he's just got precision. So it's it's not going to meet that cutoff of, of what you need to be doing as far as damage goes. Uh, you know, it's just not a good top end for your deck. You don't want to be playing the game on this much mana, and it is not a good enough oh shit button to justify getting up to that much mana at any circumstance. Because if, you, like, if you're trying to play the game on 3 mana and then you draw this card, uh, you know, you still got two turns before you can play it if things do start to go south. And that's a problem. Like, that that's the kind of thing you need to look for when you're evaluating cards. That's what makes this card bad. That's what makes this card borderline unplayable. Is that you you look at the deck as a whole, you look at what the ruler wants to be doing, you want to be playing the game on 3 mana, therefore a 5 mana spell that doesn't auto win you the game and is actually not a very good comeback mechanic at all is just not a good card. Sorry, Vanishing Fire. And then we... Alright, and now we're on to the water spoilers. So first off, we have Alternating Current Crystal. That's 0, 10, 4, drop golem, which controller mobilized. And you can tap a blue and one and tap it, and you can put a golem for your hand into the field. So I think that second ability is really the more relevant one. Because a lot of the golems that you want to be playing... You know, uh, the the nine nine flyer, the blue one is is actually really mediocre, uh, but it's pretty good if you have this card in play. Um, still, you know, not great for new frontiers because it's a nine nine flyer trying to match up to a uh, you know a twelve twelve griffin. But if the win condition for your deck is trying to you know crippling light them and then game them out, then you know something that can block the griffin and come in at instant speed is big. Uh, but the the most useful part of this would definitely be putting in the twenty twenty golem. Uh, you know, at instant speed, you have two mana, summon a 20 20, uh, pop a creature. Next turn, you can crippling light. That's a huge thing. Um, you know, this card, that's really like the best play you're going to get out of this card. And then, you know, you can attack with your 20 20 next turn because you flashed it in. It's uncounterable. Uh, it's mobilized because he's on the field. It's a little upsetting that this isn't a golem. So, one, you can't pull it out of your deck with a few of the golem spells. You can't mobile, or you can't, uh, have it count towards your golem count for Pandora to flip her. She can't prevent the damage off of it. But if this guy was a golem, I think he'd be... I want to say he'd be a little too good, but I, st I still don't know that golems would be a playable deck. He does just cost a, a lot of mana. Uh, he doesn't get any value instant. I mean, he does if you have golems on field, but I really doubt you're attacking with like your 2 and 3 drop golem on turn 4, uh, depending on your opponent's board state. Given that it's new frontiers, I'm going to go ahead and guess that you're not. So, you know... I definitely think it's something that you would want to play in your golem deck. I think you'd have to overload on this. You'd have to overload on the 2020. Um, which, you know, sounds inconsistent. And overall, I don't think golems are a good new Frontiers deck is the bottom line of things. As much as I would like them to be as cool as they are, I just don't think they're ever going to make the cut. Not ever, but not until something happens to Fox. So second, we have Aqua Rifle Mermaid. Uh, when an entry field, you rest target resonator if the weather's rain, you return it to its owner stand. Uh, I'm going to go off on a limb here and say that the Weather is Rain is probably the worst mechanic for New Frontiers. Um, second worst, actually. I think the worst is the, the Elemental Spirit Magic. Th actually, no. This is probably the worst. Um, so, like, cards like this just get no value in New Frontiers. Um, bounce spells are, are pretty irrelevant. You know, they, they're not kill spells. I can just sack my Griffin in response, or I could even just replay it. So, Aqua Rifle Mermaid, not a good card. I, even if it was just, like... The problem with a lot of the Weather is Rain cards is that in New Frontiers, if they just did what they did when the Weather is Rain, like if this card just said, you know, enter the field, return target resonator to its owner's hand, probably still wouldn't be played. 
Aquamarine Panda Diplomat. So when it enters your field, you can banish a water gem, and then if you do search your deck for a mermaid, put it in your hand. Uh, you know, five seven, so it survives shade, but it gets instant value, so that's kind of irrelevant. It's a panda that's a little awkward. Uh, I think it's like one of the only blue pandas. For the most part, they are white cards. And this isn't something you're going to see in a panda deck. So the fact that you, one, have to be playing gem production, and then you get a search for a mermaid, is just, it's so awkward. <laughs> Um, I don't think you're playing Mermaid Tribal with the Panda Ruler or Gem Production. It's just so awkward. It's not good. Bubble Golem. I actually kind of like this card. It's cheap. It sits there threateningly um, until you're ready to Crippling Light and kill your opponent. Uh, it only has to mobilize for one, so it's a very cheap just 1,000 damage if you ever manage to clear out your opponent's board. Um, you know, obviously, still not sure about its new Frontiers playability because I don't think you would play this in anything except for, uh, you know, the Golem deck. Although it is relevant that the end of battle is a triggered ability, so if you could flash something in to uh, bounce this or return it to your hand or something, flicker it, uh, it will not have to banish itself, so that's pretty cool. But once again, just not sure it's making the cut. Cleansing Rain. Uh, this, this card I actually do like. This is the one card where if it, had, um, if it said the rain ability would be played. Because it's just return something to its owner's hand if it's raining, put it on top of its... If it was just a two mana return something to the top of its owner's deck, it would be good. But because it's not, and, you know, the rain mechanic is, is absolutely garbage in New Frontiers, this card is unfortunately not playable. Um, it's kind of like a worse Rachel. Uh, the double blue inheritance returns something to the hand because Rachel can't be countered. This can get hit by the new Fairs spell and things like that, so... Overall, not a great card. Confinement, target resonator cannot attack this turn. Quick cast remnant. This is actually a pretty good card. It's the third pseudo fog of the format. We have a Moderatsu's Foresight. We have the uh, green spell, two target resonators can't attack, draw a card. And now we have this. So this is easily the worst of the um, the fog spells. You know, it's cool that it can be separated out, unlike the green one. But the green one does draw a card, so I would say this is the worst one. But it is a third fog for the format, which will probably come up later down the line. Coral Reef Mermaid, it's 7-7, seven, seven. when it's put into the graveyard, return target resonator, your opponent controls, they don't understand. Bouncing cards in Force of Will is just not super impactful, They're, unless, you know, you're an aggro deck, tempo is not super important. Um, and a lot of the blue cards are just tempo plays, which is, like, good for draft and bad for new frontiers, that's kind of the way it's always been. Blue just gets the short end of the stick, one set after another. Electrical Discharge, um, you know, it's in sorcery speed or chance speed, two target resonators don't recover during the next recovery phase, and this deals 600 of them if the weather is rain. It's completely garbage. Three mana, not what I want to be doing my turn three. Not what, I'll be, not what I want to be doing for three mana at any point in the game. It's just so mediocre. I would love for this to say, like, I don't know, just... <laughs> I'd have to completely change the, the fundamentals of this card to make it good, but having things not recover during their opponent's recovery phase is just not that good in Force of Will. It's so mediocre. Giant Squid, it's just a 5-10 vanilla for 3. It, it's not much to say on vanillas. Guard of the Coral Palace, whenever it attacks or blocks with the top card of your deck, you may put it on the bottom or the top. Um, You know... It's it's a three mana four twelve. It's it's not super impactful. Looking at the top card is like okay, but you know even if this card says whenever this card attacks or blocks, draw a card, then it would probably see play in some kind of Lumia deck. But as it stands, just looking at the top card and putting it on the top or bottom is not impactful enough to warrant a card like this seeing play. Keats, uh, you know it's a, it's a seven ten for four mana that you can pay blue to give it flying. This is a terrible card for new frontiers. It's not a twelve twelve flyer. It's not even a ten ten flyer. This is worse than the red ones. Keys' call. Now this is a this is a good card. Um, quick cash cancel an automatic ability. You draw a card. Uh, I think the draw card is really important here. I, I'm not actually sure if this card would see play if it wasn't for um the draw card. But this can negate obviously. Griffin is the most notable one. All of the chimeras. Uh, the ability to negate Captain Hook and Mariabella. Uh, and Urashime Taro kind of make it so that this card is good against everything. Which, you know, finally, uh, it, it's another reason to play blue outside of Dawn of the Earth. And overall, I think this is a really strong card for the decks that have a hard time with Fox, but want to play blue, but don't want to splash in white in order to deal with uh, 
fox with Dawn of the Earth. So, you know, you're going to see like green, blue, X, Lumia Dex, green, blue, red, green, blue, black. Uh, you know, we've seen the green, blue, white version over and over and over again. And it's just, it's not dealing with fox in a way that it needs to. So, maybe switching up the color combinations. You know, now that you're not pigeon held into white because of seal and white Arthur and butterfly and all things like that. Um, you know, obviously butterfly's still in the format, but I mean, it, there's no real need to play it if you're not, you know, you don't need to play white just for butterfly, but you needed it for seal. So, hopefully other color combinations of Lumia will start to pop up, and I think this card is kind of the key to that. Magic Sound Warrior. It's 12-12, mobilize 2. Whenever your opponent plays a chant, recover this card. Um, you know, it's not terrible. It's a big golem, and it can get searched by itself off of the 3-drop spell, so definitely something I think that would fit into your golem deck, but the fact that it's whenever your opponent plays a chant, recover it, means that you probably can't attack, like, multiple times in a turn, unless your opponent's an idiot, which I don't see happening. Uh, so, you know, it's like, okay. It, it, the second line of text is mostly irrelevant. Just imagine it's a 5 minute 12 12 with mobilized 2. And then, you know, you remember it's a golem, and those unfortunately aren't very playable in New Frontiers. But in the context of golem deck, as I've been saying, where if your main strategy is set up a board crippling like your opponent, uh, you know, this, this kind of makes it so that you would only need this, the 2020, and then like the two drop, and suddenly you have game. Uh, yeah. Because you need, I mean, those three golems out is exact game, and you need three golems out to flip Pandora, which would mobilize all of them, because otherwise it would be six mana to attack with them, so it's a pretty good deal. Uh, but unfortunately, it's still just a mediocre card in the grand scheme of things. Magic Water Warrior, pretty much the same thing. Uh, the flying is nice, but, you know, once again, you're competing with 12-12 flyers. Uh, no real reason for this card not to be a 10-10, but, you know, it's got, it's got the archetypal bonus, it's got the flying, I guess that's a reason to understat it a little bit, but it really doesn't matter. Once again, it's there's not much else to say about the golems that I haven't already said. I've kind of outlined their win condition, uh, how they would play the game, and then just watching these pseudo vanilla cards kind of fill out the curve in blue is just it's not really a whole lot to touch upon. Magical Tidal Surge. Return all non one resonators to their owner's hand. So this card is um I was talking a little earlier about how tempo's not great in Force Will, however massive board clears are, um, because it's the one thing that Fox does struggle with. Um and you know, if you have a field of water resonators, and then you can return all non-water resonators to the opponent's hand, that's great. But I really can't think of what water resonators you're swarming the board with before you play this card. Um, you know, I was talking about how Crippling Light's a good card. I was talking about how the Fire Spell is not a good card because the Fire Spell is not a total board wipe. You know, it's just a pseudo one. So I could see this in some kind of. I would assume if you're going to, if you're like, hey, Aaron, build a blue deck in New Frontiers, like a mono blue deck, I'll say for this example, because it's the only way I see myself overloading on water resonators. I'm probably building a flute deck. Um, so I've got out, you know, flutes, dragons. I've got out all these, like, mid sized, like, one, two, three drop creatures, and then I play this. I probably don't win the game off of this, but it's it's a little difficult for my opponent to set back up. The fact that this is a super rare. This is really a super rare. Are you reading that right? Oh my god, it's a super rare. It's really mediocre for a super rare. Um, I guess it's okay in draft though, but as far as new frontiers go, you know, it's not a terrible card. The the problem is that this is one of those good cards that doesn't have a home, and I really don't think it's going to find a home anytime soon. Like, not, not while this set's out, at least. Maybe next set, maybe two sets from now. Blue just needs a strong archetype that has a solid creature base in order to put itself on the map, and that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, but when it does, I wouldn't be surprised to see this card in there. Mega Thunderfish, this is the card that's pissing everybody off. Um, so when it's put into the graveyard, you return a resonator your opponent controls to its owner's hand, and if the weather's rain, you put it on top of the owner's deck. So, you know, it's a 3-mana 8-8 that's vanilla statted, that's good. Um, the fact that it does something like that on death is pretty good, but it gets plus two, plus two in swiftness as long as the weather is thunderstorm. As many of you may have noticed, there is no way in the current set to make it thunderstorm. So this card cannot reach its full potential because a 10-10 swiftness that says, uh, you know, put when it dies, put something back on top of your opponent's deck is pretty good. Uh, although I'm not sure how you're going to make it thunderstorm on your turn and then rain on your opponent's turn. Because um, I don't... 
it's 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 really hard to judge this card because I don't know if thunderstorm like counts as rain plus something because it obviously has to be raining to thunderstorm. Uh, but I, this card's too hard to evaluate because I don't know anything about the thunderstorm mechanic. So we'll, we'll come back to this card specifically when we get a thunderstorm mechanic. Ocean floor archelon uh, blocking doesn't cause it to rest, and for four mana you can give it plus four plus ten, and then it can't be blocked until end of turn. So this is actually a pretty good blue bomb, which is something that a lot of blue decks have been lacking. Anytime you go to build a, a blue based deck, you're like, all right, well, what's the win condition? Um, and that's kind of something that they've been lacking uh, for a real answer for, you know, for the four drop Charlotte with barrier for the cards in your hand is probably been their best bet up until this point, which is why you really haven't seen decks with that as the win condition doing super well. Uh, the exception to that being Tyler Wilson's GP Atlanta deck, uh, the blue-black control Val 3. Um, but, you know, that was the f only time that we've seen, like, a blue deck kind of come forth and do something. And that was, a lot of things had to fall into place correctly for that to work out. And the, pr the fact of the matter is this card just costs too much mana. And it doesn't have any kind of evasion like the Charlotte does. Uh, it's just... It's too little for what blue really needed. Because uh, you have to think, you know, you're playing blue, you probably don't have a whole lot of ramp. So you play this guy on turn six, you know, somehow by some miracle he survives. You only are going into seven mana, so you can only use the ability once. So you hit him with like a 1030 unblockable, and it's it's pretty unrealistic to think that that's going to happen, you know, three more times without your opponent killing you on the crackback after you paid six mana for this resonator, especially in New Frontiers. Uh, so overall, just a pretty overcosted card. The ability costs a lot of mana as well, which is you know probably fair because you are making it unblockable. You don't want it to be unreasonable, but uh, unfortunately, just a little less powerful than it needs to be. Pandora's Order, uh, four mana quick cast. Put target golem from your graveyard into the field. It's mobilized until end of turn. At the end, next end of turn, return it to its owner's hand. This card's actually pretty good because it does get something back from the grave and then put it back into your hand for the first blue card we saw to tap and put it back into your field. Uh, obviously, the thing you want to be hitting with this is, the, like every other golem card that doesn't have a, a cost attached to it, you want to put in the 2020 that pops a resonator. Um, and at that, it's it's very good. The thing that is also worth noting is that this is quick cast, so you just leave mana open on your opponent's turn. You play this, you pop the guy, you attack with your 2020 on your turn. Uh, so overall, a very, very good card for the Golem deck, but unfortunately, uh, as I've said multiple, multiple times, the Golem deck just doesn't quite make the cut. Princess Shayla's Attendant. Uh, it gains plus two, plus two as long as the weather is rain. Completely irrelevant. It's a, you know, the vanilla standard is a 4-4. Four, four. I talked a little earlier about how 5-5s five are irrelevant. Um, because pretty much anything that's going to, any effective kind of removal is going to deal at least 600 damage, so you know, one drop 5-5, five, five, not super relevant, not super aggro, it gets blocked out by all the two drops in the game, it dies to shade, uh, so yeah, it's just a very weak thing for it to do. I think if you wanted, because this kind of brings up the point of how big would a one drop need to be for me to want to play it, and I think the answer is a 7-7, seven, seven, because a lot of two drops that are six sixes get advantage by either being on the field. Well, maybe I'd even play a one drop six six. Um, I don't know if I'd play a one drop vanilla six six though, because if I draw it at any if I drop it at any point past turn one, like it's just useless. So I think if I was going to play a vanilla one drop, it would actually have to be a seven seven, which you know you kind of see how ridiculous of a standard that is, and you understand what I mean when I say I I, you know. I wouldn't play this card. Um, because a 1 mana 7-7, seven, seven, uh, a lot of the 2 drop 6-6s six, in the game get immediate value, or sit on the field and get value. I'm talking about things like Abdul, Messenger of Lilies, Petal, uh, Shade even. like Shade and Abdul sit there threateningly for the entire game. Messenger gets you know something on entry. Uh, Sylvia gets immediate value of hitting you for 6 and is unblockable. So I would want a, a 1 drop that can trade into those and survive and kill them. So maybe a 6-7 actually. Uh, I'd, yeah, so a 1-mana 6-7 would be what a vanilla would need to be to be playable in any capacity, uh, in my mind. So a 1-mana 5-5, five, five, as long as the weather is rain, is, you know, obviously does not make that cut. Um, yeah, I think I think that's how I'm going to judge vanillas. I would need a 1-mana 6-7 vanilla in order for it to be playable. 
uh, two drop seabeds. Uh, I don't know why I said two drop. Uh, this is seabeds and in, seabed investigation. Uh, you essentially ancient knowledge, but you do four instead of five, and you get to put two mermaids or put two cards into your hand. Uh, let me start over on that. So you look at the top four of your deck. Uh, you put a card into your hand from among them, and the rest on your bottom in an order. And if you control a mermaid, you put two into your hand instead. So, you know, it, as a tempo deck that blue wants to be, you really can't afford to be spending two mana at sorcery speed doing something like this. Even if you play a one-drop mermaid, you know, this card's kind of mediocre. Uh, you just play Ancient Knowledge instead every single time. The instant speed is absolutely worth it. Shale is elite. Um... When it comes into play, you get to search your deck for a mermaid that's not Shale as Elite and put it in your hand. There aren't any good... Let me show you what mermaids actually exist. So you can, once again, understand what I mean. So, we have the, the three mana 7-7 seven, seven that I was talking about earlier that's bad. The uh, panda, that's not a mermaid, it just comes up because there's a mermaid on it. Um, yeah, there's really nothing like... Big. They're all like low costed, pretty irrelevant. There's this one from the structure deck. Um, but that's just a 4 mana 10 10, you know? And it can gain flying when the weather's rain, but then you have to be playing Shayla, which is not the. Uh... Oh, where's Shayla? Oh, she's a mermaid. Okay. Um, you know, not, not my blue ruler of choice. So she doesn't do anything for mermaids. There's just no reason to be running Mermaid Tribal. Like, your support's just really weak. Um, especially for something like the yeah the one mana not six seven is a mermaid. They're just all really mediocre cards. I think you can kind of see that for yourself. Um, if we're talking about a, a competitive standpoint, I don't think anybody ever thought that mermaids were going to be, you know, viable. Uh, this card just kind of adds to that because it can't search itself, which you know there's no reason for it not to be able to. Like it's a mediocre enough card that like it, it should be able to search itself. There are a lot of two drops that only search themselves. I think giving blue something that searched itself and others wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, you know? Uh, we saw World Tree Protector doing very well in, uh, you know, New Frontiers for a while in the Fox decks. That could search itself and other things, and it got a lot bigger than this, so I think this card's just um, entirely too fair. It's actually less than fair, it's underpowered. It's unfortunate. Shale is Foresight, so quick cast uh, if you're, you know, ruler is Shayla, you can pick up to three. Uh, so put target attacking resonator on top of its owner's deck, you know, not bad. Uh, put target addition on top of its owner's deck, not bad. Or target player uh, shuffles their grave into their deck, and you draw a card. Oh, sorry. Wait, what? Oh, okay, so the, the first ability is actually put target attacking resonator on top of its owner's deck, or put target addition on top of its owner's deck, and then it's uh, horn effect, or draw a card. Um... So overall, not good. Uh, they're, you know, it, it it's better than um, I believe it was called detachment was a card from the last set that was just two mana put target attacking or blocking resonator on top of its owner's deck. Uh, this only does attacking resonators, so it's a little less versatile. Uh, if you're running Schleia, then sure, you know, you can get the horn and the draw card. And I believe this is the only card we currently have that can mash shuffle stones back into your deck. But blue's kind of a weird color to have that in. Um, so overall, just not a very good card. Uh, you're probably not going to be playing Shayla, so you're probably only getting one mode, and the one mode that you're going to be picking most of the time is put an addition on top of its owner's deck, or put an attacking resonator on top of the owner's deck, which I can't think of what addition I only want put away for a turn, except like maybe zero circle of protection, but if I'm playing a blue base deck to play this card, I, I playing Lumia Hook, which is probably one of the decks that cares the least about that card, so, you know, overall, just, this card's in the wrong colors, essentially. Song of Sympathy, played only if you control two or more mermaids, gain control target resonator for a four mana chant, that's just entirely too much, especially because I do have to control two mermaids, I was talking earlier about how none of the mermaids are good, um, so this would only fit into a mermaid deck, obviously, which makes it a bad card in Force of Will, even if it was just, uh, four mana gain control of target resonator, you know, You'd probably play that, but maybe not as a 4-mana chance speed. Because I don't know if I would play a 4-mana chance speed removal spell. Well, I definitely wouldn't, actually. Um, people barely play 2-mana chance speed removal spells, so 4-mana chance speed uh, potential removal spell with upside. You know, it's not really making the cut. 
spinning aqua soul. I actually do like this card a lot. This is, um, you know, I feel like I, I'm extra harsh on blue, but that's just because blue's not good. Like, I can't do anything about that. But when blue cards stand out, they stand out. And it's really things like Keys is calling Spinning Aqua Soul, the one mana blue instance, you know, uh, water Charlotte's Water Transformation Magic. Blue one cost instants tend to be what stand out and what are splashable. And because blue base isn't good, hasn't been good in Force of Will pretty much ever, um, you need the you need to look for the cards that you can splash, and I think this card's actually very, very good. The ability to play up to eight of any chant in your deck is insane to me. Unfortunately, there's no, like, reward for looping these. There's no, like, storm count or anything like that in Force Soul. Um, so, you know, spin looping, spinning Aqua Souls, not really going to get you anywhere. But I do like this card for a lot of different decks. The Coral Palace, two mana uh, addition, four mana draw card. Uh, don't like it. It's, it's just entirely too slow. I don't think anyone's really going to argue that. There's no real like, mana ramp in, in blue, so getting to this and doing it consistently, which is what you would need to do to have this card gain value, is not good. If you like play this card turn 3, turn or turn 2, turn 3, play a different card, turn 4, you know, pass draw a card, like, that's really bad. You actually have to like sit down and look at what turns you can do things, and this is not what you want to do with turn 4. Turn 4, you don't want to draw, like, you're sacrificing two of the most pivotal turns of the game, although I, I think turn 5 is more important than turn 4 in Force Will. Um, you know, you're just sacrificing the turn going into turn 5 to draw a card. Yeah, it's just not good. Not good. The, very improper timing. Uh, Thunderfish. Uh, when it enters the field, target resonator doesn't recover during its controller's next recovery phase. I was talking earlier about how that's not a very good mechanic in force. And when it's put into the graveyard from the field, draw a card if the weather is rain. Um, Let's let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about why I don't like when this card or er, resonators uh, doesn't recover during its controller's next recovery phase. So the things that you want to have stay tapped down have important activate abilities. Um, I'm talking about things like let's say for example Shade and Guinevere. Um, for the most part, a your opponent's not attacking you with shades, uh, and if they are, you would rather instant speed you know kill it with something than uh, wait to play something that makes it not recover uh, and then like Guinevere the problem with uh, force of will and things not recovering is how summoning sickness in this game works uh, because I don't have to wait for my turn to you know use the activate ability because I do have the ability to you know do things before my untap you're never really gonna find a key target tapped on your turn to play something like Thunderfish and keep it tapped. I'm going to be doing these things either at the end of your turn, at the beginning of my turn. Uh, you're just never going to find the opportunity on key targets to keep them rested indefinitely. That's just not how the game operates. Um, it, like if I attack you with a shade, then that's probably where you get your value out of this, but it'd be much better to play something that kills my shade, and that's really the only situation where uh, an ability like this would be relevant is hitting a, sh a shade that attacked. So for something that narrow to be your only use and something that doesn't happen very often to be your only use, it's just not a good mechanic. Waterfowl, 5-7 uh, as long as the weather's rain. Flying, uh, once again, does not meet my vanilla standard of 6-7 that I would need for a 1-drop, so you know, not a fan of the, like this, could, or 5-8, sorry. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, a five eight flyer is nothing. You need to at least have six hundred attack if you're going to have more than six hundred defense, so that you can trade with all the six sixes in the game. Weather change rain, you know, obviously good for your rain deck, bad for everything else. All right, so now we're on to the green cards, uh, starting with Absolute Awareness. I think this card's terrible. Um, I mean, I if you look at it, it's it's actually just a worse Magic Stone analysis, which is uh, kind of a shame. And I understand that it's a spirit magic, so the whole the whole point of it being worse is that you can play it for one mana. My problem is that you can never play it for one mana turn one going first. You can play it for one mana going second um, if you know you can get an elemental to grave with your first one mana, by, be it either planting beans or the uh, draw discard green one drop. Um, but at that point, you might as well just energize into this card, you know, so you don't lose the severing winds kind of thing. And it's, it's really just kind of irredeemable in that way. If it was spirit magic slash elemental, um, I could almost see it so that you could, you know, exile it from grave for further use of spirit magics, but it's not, so uh, I, I could never see you playing this card over magic stone analysis. Harrow Trap, I feel like um, 
trap is the keyword here, uh, because a lot of people are going to fall into the trap of thinking this is a good card. Um, so 600 damage target attacking resonator. Uh, that's mostly relevant against Prissia. Um, if you're a deck that loses to the Fox 6-6 um, six, six beatdown plan, I really don't think this card is going to, is like the answer you were looking for. And dealing 1200 damage to an attacking flyer is also really bad against Fox, because if they are attacking with the Griffin, that means it didn't enter the field this turn, and most likely means that they can Fox this turn. Um, which really, to me, makes this a worse Gale Force, um, because Gale Force can at least guaranteed kill the Griffin, and, you know, maybe maybe there is arguments for the versatility of this card. Uh, you know, if you play this over Gale Force, then you can, um, you do have the option to kill Abdul if they attack with it for whatever reason, because, if, if, let's be real, if you're a deck that loses to Abdul, um, I'm not attacking you with it, uh, because then it's tapped down, you could attack me, and you could attack it, uh, if you're playing something like, I don't know, like Bant Lumia, uh, you know, you could just play Zero's Magic Light if you're if you're actually that worried about it. If you think I'm going to attack with a duel that hard, I really don't think that this card um, answers any of the questions that people, you know, were looking for uh, when they wanted more answers to Fox. I just think this card looks appealing, but uh, when you actually get down to brass tacks, it just doesn't do what you think it's going to do. Um, and, and the big part is that the Resonator has to be attacked. It's also not J Resonator, uh, which actually would have made this good against Prissia, because, you know, then 600 really takes care of the Sylvia. That's one of the main problems. Then if it was, like, J Resonator with flying, then this could actually kill the Prissia uh, once it gets up to a 12 toll flyer with the God's Art and the Sprinting Flame Horse, but unfortunately does not, so not a good card, in my opinion. Bullseye Bow, don't think I need to explain why this card's not good for mana sorcery speed kill spells. I think I was talking about those earlier and how you wouldn't play them. And this is a conditional one, so not good. Uh, Commander of the Crowd. I actually like this card a lot. Um, I think this is the card that um, is going to make elves viable, if elves are any kind of viable. Uh, so far, I think elves look neat, um, as I'll talk a bit more about later once we get to the ruler. Uh, the problem is that there's really not a way to make them not lose to final battle, and Fox plays final battle, so, you know, unfortunately. Not something that I could see competing in the format. Uh, it's not unreasonable for elves to be able to sneak out wins if you can stick a turn one uh, secret elven village, the addition that gives all your elves uh, plus zero, plus two, you know, lets them block flyers without being flyers themselves. And But unfortunately, that's really the only way I could see a deck like this surviving Prissia or against Fox long enough to try to make it to whatever mid-late game strategy the elf deck has set up, because elves, elves is not an early game deck. I don't think anyone's going to try and argue with me on that one. Um, elves are a deck that require a lot of setup, a huge board, and then you're going to swing in uh, for lethal in like one turn or something. But I will I will get into a little bit later that I do like the direction that elves have taken. Um, and I do think that there could be a way to break them maybe next set. Uh, but at the moment, I'm not finding anything. Elemental Blast. Uh, not sure how I feel about this card either. It is kind of cool that you can make it cost zero. Um, it's kind of a problem that it's not quick cast. Uh, 400 damage really doesn't deal with a whole lot except Shade, but uh, Chant Removal Spade on Shade obviously doesn't work. You know, worst case, or your best case scenario is to kill Shade and they just shoot itself and gain 600 life, and as, you know, sure the Shade's off the board, but if, you know, you want to play something that would die to Shade after this, then all of a sudden you're vulnerable to Severing Winds. Uh, that's one of the big reasons that Sorcery Speed Removal isn't good is because of Severing Winds, because... You know, you go play the Sorcery Speed Removal, you play whatever, like, you, let's say you want to kill my Abdul, you like, uh, you play it, I don't know, this card, un, nah, not this card, um, I don't know, Space Time Collapse is the only example I can think of. You play Space Time Collapse on Abdul, then you try to play something, that something is vulnerable to Severing Winds. Um, you know, just, the, the 700 damage is really relevant, but I feel like this card should actually could actually just say, like, this card deals 700 damage to target Resonator, because it's Sorcery Speed. Um... But at the same time, then, you know, it's a fox card. <laughs> anytime, anytime you print something in green and black, especially low-costing removal spells, you need to go, does this break fox final battle? Um, but overall, not, not a huge fan of this card. I just think uh, it being sorcery speed really is, is very unfortunate here. Elf in the Trees, the beginning of your main phase, produce green. Not a huge fan of this card. Uh, it's cool that it doesn't die to shade. It's cool that it doesn't have to tap two ramps so that it's not vulnerable to being attacked. Um, one of the reasons we see Lumia Hook 
constantly come up as the best ramp deck is because your your mana dorks are not vulnerable to being attacked because you can flicker them at the end of turn and then by the time you've stopped flickering them you're flickering more relevant things so the, the mana dorks doesn't matter so this is kind of cool um i'm not sure it would be played like if i were to build an elf deck i'm not sure i would play this card uh, it's kind of cool that it is consistent mana the problem is that other than that he really doesn't do anything i almost feel like i would like this card more if it was an addition Elvish Hunter, when it enters the field, deals 100 damage multiplied by the number of elves you control to target Resonator. Uh, what's the Elf in the Trees, yeah, I said his name. Um, so yeah, Elvish, on the Elvish Hunter, 3 drops, 6, 7. As I was saying earlier, these are the stats I want on a 1 mana vanilla. So seeing these stats on a 3 drop, not super promising. And then, you know, you deal 100 damage multiplied by the number of elves you control uh, to target Resonator, not even J Resonator. Um, I really think that archetypal things like this should really be more versatile, be able to hit J-Rulers. Uh, so the fact that it only hits Resonators is rough, the fact that it can't kill Abdul is rough, because, um, you know, it's an enter trigger. Uh, and overall, to really get value out of this, you're going to need, god, like, at least six, like, you need six elves on the field to kill a two-drop. And, spoiler alert, you are not getting six elves on the field by turn three, unless you go, like, turn one energize into the two one drops that make one one tokens and then turn two you play the two drop that makes a one one token and then play this card turn three that's the only way you're killing a two drop with this card so it's not something you want to play on curve and that just makes it more awkward um you know maybe sure maybe you're playing a bunch of the the ramp elves um you know you're playing like sacred elves and melfies uh so that this card's like a late game removal spell but then you're just it's really win more in my opinion, you know, if you've already got the huge setup for this card to be relevant and be able to kill something, do you really need to be killing something? Can't you just uh, play a pump spell with all the mana that you have and win the game instead? You know, it's it's just, uh, it's ill-timed. If it was 200 per elf and it, like, no, yeah, that'd be too broken. Now, there's just really no good way to like balance a card like this. Uh, it's either going to be overpowered or it's going to be bad. And here, I think it, I think it's bad. Failure Latelia. This is a guy I want to talk about. Um, he's the green ruler. Judgments for three, and you can rest two elves to uh, recover a magic stone. So, and you can do that once per turn. So, not just on your turn. Um, it's pretty important to note. Uh, but the big thing is that means you can actually flip him on turn three. Uh, and because you know he costs three to flip, but you could just like untap like turn three instead of a uh, you know calling a stone you just tap your two stones you tap two guys to untap and flip this guy in um and then you get to on the other side pull a four drop elf out of your deck uh and he enters with four gale counters and the gale counters can be removed to give an elf either barrier or plus three plus three which is really interesting because it means when this guy flips he represents three thousand damage by himself because uh, I believe the biggest 4-drop elf you can pull out is a 10-10, and then if he were to remove all of the gale counters, all four of the gale counters to bump himself by 12, then he would be a 2,000. Um, so he really represents a lot of damage by himself. And I really think that if you're going to run elves, like this is absolutely the ruler that you want to be doing it in, just because he does uh, auto-represent so much damage, he ramps you so much without having to commit to playing things like uh, Elvish Priest in your deck. You know, all of a sudden the 1-1 um, one -one that makes a 1-drop elf is you know, its own mana dork and an instant speed, or uh, not an instant speed mana dork, but a mana dork that can be used the turn it comes into play. Swiftness mana dork is, is the term that I wanted to use there, uh, because you can just rest the elf and the token in order to untap a stone with this guy, play another one drop perhaps, but, uh, you know, in a deck that ramps this hard, I don't think you want to be playing too many one drops, um, which is again where the, the last card, uh, the elvish archer or whatever, just kind of falls flat. You're not, you don't want to be shitting out elves, you want to be I don't know, playing mid-sized elves. You want to be swarming the board with things that matter. You want to be swarming with like things like Oberon, things like the three drop that makes two elves. You don't want to be, you know, summoning one and two drops that make a one one. You want to be summoning like four drops that make three one ones, three drops that make two one ones. You don't want to be plus oneing. You want to be plus twoing and threeing, uh, because if you're going to be shitting out one one tokens. You know, you might as well get some actual value out of it. Because one 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 token isn't threatening, but the three of them, and then suddenly I also have a guy that attacks and makes them two twos. Now we're starting to get into the realm of like things that I care about. Uh, this, you know, this deck also does have an unfortunate weakness to Alice's World of Madness and Makage in general. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of people talking about how this is a, a Fox Makage format. So, unfortunately, elves probably not going to see their time in the sun for quite a while. Uh, but you know, people thought that um, that Feetsing's World. Uh, had a bad Makage matchup too, and that, 
That didn't work out super well for Mikage, so we'll see. People have been wrong before. I've been wrong before. We'll see how this elf deck matches up to the to the format. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be see me being the one, you know, trying to break this. Uh, Fairies command, recover all resonators control, resonators you control gain plus a thousand plus a thousand and pierce still end of turn. Obviously the big uh, pump spell and win condition of the elf deck in the minds of a lot of people. Um, not sure how I feel about it. I think that seven mana is just way too expensive. I understand that, you know, the whole purpose of your deck <laughs> um, is to play big things, but uh, I think I'd rather see something like... Um, uh, I don't actually remember the name of it off the top of my head. Nope. I got baited. Um, here we go. Rendezvous with Wind and Light. I feel like this is a better win condition for an elf deck than uh, than Fair's Command. This comes out a lot faster. It's a permanent buff. Obviously, it's not as impactful, but I really don't think... Realistically, in New Frontiers, I'm not totally sure you get to a point where you're actually going to play this card, especially if you're focused on flipping Fair as soon as possible. Um, you know, the big thing about Fayer is that if you attack with him, he, he kind of demands to be blocked just because he he has the option to pump himself up to a 2k, 2k uh, at any point. You can't really afford to take that risk, and then if, you know, they don't block it, like, you can just go, okay, you take 800, and if they, you know, if at some point they're below 2,000, you just go, okay, body you for game. I really don't think Fayer's Command is the kind of top end you want to be running in the deck. I definitely think something like Rendezvous of Wind and Light, that is instant speed, gives a permanent buff. Uh, is really more for what you're going to be looking for in an elf deck like this, especially because you can untap one of your stones on your turn and then untap another stone on your opponent's turn. I think that instants gain a lot of value in that. Because um, you could even do this before you untap. If you if you leave open one mana, alright, so you leave open one mana, right? And then at the end of your turn, you untap a stone. And then on your opponent's turn, you untap a stone. And then before you recover, you untap a stone. You know, you could play this... I mean, that, obviously that requires six elves, but, you know, if you just shitting out a bunch of elf tokens, what else are you going to do with them? So that's why I don't like Fair's Command. I, I think it's just a worse rendezvous of Wind and Light in most instances. We have Fair's Escort. Um, this isn't the kind of top end you want to be playing either. Uh, I keep saying top end, like it's it's a ramp deck, but you really don't want to top out, you really want to be, you know, I think like Oberon might be the most expensive card you want to play, you just don't get a whole lot of value out of like the high costing elves. You know, t untapping a Untapping an elf at the next end of turn, like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, obviously not a, a very New Frontiers viable card. Uh, you know, five mana, ten tens. You really have to, you have to be really impactful to, to. You have to be Captain Hook level to be playable with those stats compared to that mana cost. And Fair's Escort is absolutely nowhere near the power level. Um, like I could see Captain Hook just being played. Like I could see Captain Elf, Captain Hook being played in elves, but not this guy. Fair spell. Um, this card's absolutely bonkers. Uh, just another tool that Fox gets to keep them solidified over the top. I kept saying about how I think Fox is unplayable if they don't get a reprint of Keen Sense. Um, I'm not sure if I think this is better than Keen Sense. It's definitely more efficient, um, as more efficient cards to stop Fox have gotten printed, like Keys's Call. Um, and then it also just randomly stops a few things. Like, I, I can just randomly hit Melfi's with this, and there's really no other instance that I'm worried about in the, the Lumia hook deck. Um, you know, if they have, like, if I go off with this in hand, and then, like, they don't Keys's Call, or they don't Dawn of the Earth me, then I'm like, oh, they actually just don't have it. This card's almost useless. Um, and at that point, by the time I've started popping off the deck, that deck doesn't have a lot of draw power once I can get out things to block their Divine Birds of Ataractia, so I have no problems using this on a Melfi. Uh, if they don't dawn or keys call me the first time around. This card's just so... there's a lot of random things that you can hit with this that you don't think about until you have it sitting supposedly dead in your hand and then you do. But one of the big things is that this can hit Severing Winds. And it can, you know, obviously hit itself, it can hit dawn, keys call. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that for decks that aren't Fox, you're, you're hard pressed to find things that impact you that this hits. Uh, it doesn't hit Final Battle which is how Fox takes a lot of decks out of the meta. Um, you know, it hits it hits pretty much all of Prissy's spells, uh, Lightning Strike, Blood Boil, things of that nature. Um, and it hits things like Demon Flame and uh, Lethal Arrow, but I'm not sure if I feel good about using this on something like that, when you know the deck plays eight of them. Sorry. Uh, moving on. Gentle Breeze Elemental. Uh, 
quick cast draw card. See, this is what I'm talking about, the Spirit Magic Elemental. So you can ha play this at a reduced cost, and you can also use it use it to reduce costs. That's the kind of thing that you want to be doing in that deck. Um, but I really think the the elemental stuff is, is just overall not good at all. Uh, the things that they can reduce the cost of are mediocre at best. Um, you know, there's, there's not really a Spirit Magic that I care about playing. Uh, they're just very unimpactful, the elementals are bad cards. Uh, so sure, this you know fits into that deck, but the deck's not good. Great Tornado, this card's also not very good. Destroying two target non-Magic Stone entities, sure, you know, it's J Ruler removal in green. But at what cost? I can answer that a really fucking high one. Um, you know, even if you're playing this in Elves, like I, I, and you can tap six Elves, and you do for whatever reason, I don't think one mana destroy two target non-magic stones is really going to be super impactful for the meta because um, you know if you target like it, it's new frontiers so if you're like oh I'll pop these two cards then I go okay sack them both to make a chimera um, and this is really only useful in like swarm decks because like in, in Bant Lumia you know I'm not getting a whole lot of value out of this or maybe I am maybe I'm thinking about it too hard um, but realistically no because this is still Usually what I have out is like mana dorks, like let's say I have out an, a sacred alpha Melfi and a bird, then like sure, you know, I can use this to pop a duel. Um, but one of the big problems is that it, it has to be two targets. Um, so if they just have out Abdul and that's all they're holding it down with, then I'd have to destroy one of my own cards, which like sure, I'm, I guess I'm fine trading my bird for an Abdul, but realistically is this something I'm going to be able to be playing early enough in the game for it to be impactful? You know, it's, it, it's a win more card. Uh, if you're behind on board, then this card's absolutely useless. Uh, and, you know, sure, you can play Resonators as you play them, but because it's only reducing the cost by one, instead of... Oh, uh, that's right, God. So, yeah, if I tap three guys, it's four mana. Sorry. Um, because it's only reducing the cost by one, instead of something like Titania, where you re reduce the cost by two, then even if I play a one-drop, I've just evened out on my mana. Um, so, I don't know. It, it's definitely a card to keep an eye on, but I don't think it's going to have any immediate impact. Leaf Archer, uh, this is kind of what I was talking about um, with the elementals being bad. You know, sure, you can block J Resonators with flying, but with that 1200 defense, all you're doing is dying to a Griffin, and because he has to tap himself to deal 600 to a Resonator with flying, he can't actually trade with them um, unless somehow the Griffin target attacks him for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, two mana tap himself, deal 600 to something with flying is just not great. If he was, you know, deal 600 to target Resonator, then, you know, we're in business, suddenly green has an Abdul answer. But unfortunately, he just doesn't do that. This is just a 4-4 four, four elemental for one mana. Like I was talking about, it should be a 6-7 to be playable. Uh, Leaf Guard, it's a 4-8. Like, this doesn't even <laughs> meet the stat line for what I would need out of a 1-drop a vanilla to be playable. And this is a 2-drop vanilla. Um, you know, sure, it's an elemental, but I, as I was talking about a little earlier, I don't really think that matters. Leaf Healer. Uh, as funny as his face is, and I do think it's I do think it's a cute card. Um, I, I don't see it being playable. Uh, the only things you would consider this in is like Lumia, Fox. Those are the only like green decks that can ramp easily that I can think of. But Lumia really doesn't want to recover all its resonators at end of turn. It wants to flicker one of them and call it a day. Um, and then Fox. The hell do I care about? You know, untapping all my. If I'm gonna cost. If I'm gonna spend five mana on something in Fox, like, it better be super impactful, and this just isn't. Even in the mirror, like, just, you know, swinging out and then playing this to untap my guys, like, I might win, like, a game off of that, but I was probably already in a very good position to win that game, and that's just, like, a one time surprise factor thing. It's just, it's just not worth it in any uh, scenarios that I can think of. Leaf Knight, uh, you know. It meets the vanilla standard, but, you know, it's an elemental, and you can remove an elemental from the game, it gets plus two, plus two, you can do that twice, so it could be a two mana 10-10, uh, for, you know, until end of turn, and then, if you remove an elemental, he gains barrier, so if you remove three cards from your graveyard, you have a two mana 10-10 with barrier, um, which just dies to, like, everything, it's, you know, it's pretty unfortunate, uh, when the field two target elves gain plus two, plus two until end of turn, I, I almost wish this card just said put two 1-1 one -one counters on two elves, um, at the moment, though, you know, obviously not very impactful, an extra 400 damage, potentially. Uh, uh, the problem is that you can't stack the buffs onto a single elf. Um, 
you know, you can't like uh, just turn a 1-1 one, one token into a 5-5. Five, five. You have to make two 1-1s, one, one, three threes, which just isn't as impactful. If he was a little more versatile and could double stack the buffs onto one Resonator, I might think he's a little bit better, but at the moment I'm just not seeing him fitting into uh, the elf deck. He doesn't swarm, he doesn't really impact the board. Um, you would need like a significant buff to play an elf that doesn't, you know, spawn more elves or contribute to the overall strategy. Uh, that's really what I mean when I say, like, this card isn't good even in an elf deck, and uh, as I was saying, you know, I don't think the elf deck is good in New Frontiers, but hypothetically, if it were, I still don't think that this is the kind of card that you want in your elf deck. It doesn't produce any mana, it doesn't produce board state, it just, you know, hits them for an extra 400 damage uh, in the early game. Like, if you go one, you know, turn one, play your 1-1 one, one elf, that makes a 1-1 one, one elf, um, and then turn two, you play this guy, like, you hit your opponent for 600, but I really don't think early chip damage is what you're going to be doing to win the game. I think you're going to really finish off your opponent with one giant hit. And, you know, obviously, games don't always work out like that. It does come down to the chip damage sometimes, but I, I, if the 400 damage from this guy coming in on turn two and buffing your 1-1s one is what won you the game, you really need to look at your deck again. Portal in the Woods. Uh, once again, not, not a huge fan of this card. I just think that it's a little bit too slow. And, you know, in, in New Frontiers overall, I, I don't think something that's just constantly putting out 1-1 tokens at the cost of your turn 2 is is really a good thing, because Force Will, the most impactful turns in the game are turns 1, 2, 3, and 5. Um, turn 4 is irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> the only reason that turn 3 is relevant is because that is the turn that you um, will generally flip Fox if you played a Messenger Familiar um, on turn 1. Because you know, turn one you play, the, you energize them the messenger. Turn two you call the killing stone. Turn three you flip. Turn four is sometimes impactful because if you go first, that's when you have to flip fox. Um, you know, after playing your messenger on turn two. Turn five is Captain Hook turn. Turn three is the turn that Captain Hook is the most threatening in the game. If they go mana dork, mana dork, they can play Captain Hook on turn three. That's why turn three is important. Is it's really like uh, fox flips and Captain Hook. Um, and turn two. Turn two is probably one of the most important ones. Turn two is where Shade comes out, Abdul comes out, Messenger comes out. Uh, trying to think. Uh, it's the turn that Makage gets to go ping kill spell. It's the turn that Sylvia comes out in Prisia. It's how much mana Prisia flips for. Um, so you look at the other things in the game that you can do for two mana, and you have a card that makes a 1-1 at the end of the turn, and then, you know, every subsequent end of your turn thereafter. Uh, I don't know, maybe elves are lacking in Swarm and need to play this card, but uh, I believe that they could fill up the gaps somewhere else. I really don't think this is the kind of thing that elves would need to turn to to try and make them a good deck. This is the 1-1 the one -one that I keep referring to, Spirit Caller Elf, uh, that just shits out a 1-1 one -one token. So, you know, this has been used in a lot of my examples. Obviously, I think this is uh, the bread and butter of an elf deck. Um, but, you know, I also don't think elves are New Frontiers viable, so unfortunately, uh, this card's also not very splashable, so... Unfortunately, not a very good card in New Frontiers. Spiritual Guidance, draw two cards and gain 100 life for each card in your hand. So, uh, let me start off by saying I don't think this card is good, first off. Um, sure, you know, it's two mana if you play, uh, if you're playing the Gil Ruler and, you know, Exile and Elemental from your graveyard. But historically, two mana draw two cards is not good in Force of Will. Um, you know, it's just, it's too low impact. Valentina's Reach is, is really the only draw spell that ever is worth a damn. Ancient Knowledge is worth it because it's instant speed, but two mana... Let me let me reiterate this very carefully because not all of you seem to understand this. Two mana, chance speed, draw two cards, is bad in Force of Will. I don't give a shit what colors it's in because it has now been printed in green, black, and blue. And when was the last time you saw 4C in a top 8 deck list? And yet, yeah, you can make the argument, oh, it was a blue card. That's fair. You know, blue wasn't a very strongly supported color. Um, ancient Knowledge is a totally different beast uh, because it's instant speed. I will pay four mana for an Ancient Knowledge. I will not pay two mana for four C. Um, and the reason for that is that, one, you usually can't play them on turn two. As I was saying earlier, turn two is super impactful. It's probably one of the most important turns in Force of Will. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely say turn two is 
either the most or the second most important game or turn enforceable. Turn three could be it if like a uh, turn three hook is threatened or something along those lines. But for the most part, what you play on turn two is really going to set the pace of the game in a lot of uh, new frontier settings right now. You can't afford to just pass your turn two, and if you're drawing two cards, that's essentially what you're doing. Even if you just leave open two mana, that's a lot more threatening than drawing two cards. Um, so you're ne you're never going to see me like a two drop. Uh, draw two cards, and this isn't even a two drop draw two cards, it's a three drop draw two cards, because let's be real, you're not fucking running Gil Lapis, or Gil, I don't even know what his name is, it's, I'm gonna have to look this guy up, I know it's, I know it's Gil, but that's all I got. Oh, it's actually just Gil. <laughs> alright, um, Gil, the alright, yeah, it's actually just Gil. Looks like my fucking neighbor, Gil. Hey, Gil, can I borrow your lawnmower? Then Gil's gonna take offense because he's an elemental. You get it? Yeah, that's funny. Um, but yeah, so realistically, you're not running Gil in New Frontiers, which means this is a three mana. Um, you know, draw two cards. Foeman of the World Tree was a two mana draw. You know, make your hand better. Draw one card. So it's essentially a draw two cards. If it plus ones, I counted as a draw two cards. Uh, if I remember correctly, Foment was a plus one. Maybe it just neutraled out. Yeah, I think it just neutraled out, because I know it was draw that many plus one, but you had to play the card to play it. Yeah, I think... So, yeah, Foment, Foment neutraled out. So, spirit or Spiritual Guidance, you know, being three mana... I just went on a huge rant about how I don't like two drop spells. You think I like a three drop draw two cards? Fuck out of here. Tia Latelio, Archer Princess of Elves. So... I initially liked this card, and the more I look at it, the less I like it, it is kind of how I'm feeling about this. Um, you know, 4 mana 9-9, nine, nine, uh, not phenomenal stats, but I feel like what she brings to the table kind of overwrites that. Uh, you know, you get your little bird, um, which I will point out because it's relevant. Uh, so when she comes in, she gives she targets something, and any time that thing would take damage, it dies. It, um, and then, you know, the bird has swiftness if you control her, which you will if you pull it out of your deck with that, and then when it attacks it deals 200 damage to something. So she comes in, she essentially kills a guy if you're playing the bird. The problem is that I really don't like playing her and the bird in the same deck, and I think tapping 6 mana to deal 1000 damage to your opponent is actually pretty bad, um, considering you could just attack with her instead. And, you know, obviously it, it's meant to be played in situations where you can't just do that. Um, it is kind of a sit on the back lines, tap six, you know, leave all my mana open, tap six, and uh, you know, deal a thousand damage to you. The problem is that I don't think that's what green decks are doing anymore. Now that Seal and Wind and Light is gone, and Vanish is so mediocre against so many other decks, and it's the three the three cost really did make it um, not a good card. You know, Seal was on curve with a lot of the aggro creatures. Seal wasn't bad against Prissia. You know, they go turn two Jack. I just go Seal of Wind and Light. You could energize into it with Lumia. That was one of the big things, was that you could energize into Seal with the Lumia. Uh, and Vanish just hasn't stood up. Um, I don't think it's going to stand the test of time. I think it's actually really mediocre for how fast the meta has become. Uh, so green decks really aren't leaving open all their mana to, to deal a thousand damage anymore. And I thought I might like her in Makage. You know, you play her as a five drop, uh, and then, you know, you just ping something and it dies. But once again, the, the six mana deal a thousand, I'd rather just attack with her uh, almost nine times out of ten. And if I'm not in a position to be attacking with my 9-9, nine -nine, then I'm probably losing the game. <laughs> um, so I think she might be okay in green Makage variants, but that's really the only place I could see her falling into the meta. I'm not even, I don't even think I would play her in the elf deck. And then the white falcon, um, Tia's white falcon, sorry. Uh, I don't even like it in decks with Tia, so on its own it's, it's a really mediocre card. Trap Master Jason. Um, or Trapmaster Lemuria, if you're not, you know, well-versed in your memes. Uh, so that's quick cast. Um, costs four less if your opponent has, you know, attacked with three or more things this turn, then it deals 800 damage to target attacking Resonator. A um, few problems with this is that, one, your opponent's probably not attacking you with three guys unless they're, like, griffins, in which case this card's irrelevant anyway. Um, it gets shut down by Abdul, and sure, you know, if, if I'm attacking with Abdul, you could just block the Abdul, uh, so the 800 being added on doesn't really matter. It 
doesn't trade with giant either is a big problem. And I, I really doubt you'd get to a situation where I'm attacking with giant and two other creatures and that the giant was going last. Um, I want to hit you for 17 as soon as possible. Like, if there's a giant on my field, catch me going untap attack with giant. I don't care if I had cards to play that were better before that. As soon as my giant is on the field for an entire turn and I can attack with it, I'm doing it as soon as possible. Um, so even in a, in a mystical magical land where I attack with my giant third, this card doesn't even trade with it. Uh, it, it leaves it at 100 life, which is, you know, just not good. Um, and it's an elf, but that's irrelevant because it doesn't do elf things. Tree Root Scout, another... Uh, this is actually a fairy. Why are there fairies still being printed? Force Will does this weird thing with typing, um, where cards that should be one type are another one, and this is an example of that. Like, I looking at this card, I thought it was an elemental. Um, all the fairy support is rotated out of New Frontiers. I can't imagine why you would print a fairy now, of all times. And it doesn't even do anything relevant. It searches an elemental to put in your graveyard, or it destroys uh, an addition or regalia. Um, you know, it's just, 3 mana destroy in addition is, is something we have in other colors, and something that green is not lacking in, you just play Heavenly Gust. You know, even if this card was an elemental, I don't think it would be good, but it would make sense for it to be an elemental. Like, why is my fairy sending elementals from my deck to my grave? How does that make any sense? It's fucking mixed typing. Wind, wind, wind blade. Sorry, I was I was trying to say Wing Blast, um, but this card is not at all called Wing Blast. It's called Wind Blade. I don't hate this card. You know, for three mana, uh, or not for three mana, but on three stones, um, for the most part, it's going to be a uh, two mana deal, three hundred damage to target resonator, or deal six hundred damage to target resonator, which you know kills of duels uh, on turn two. Even this can kill shade at instant speed, which is pretty good. And it's an elemental chance, so you can remove this to play your other uh, spirit magics if you're playing Gil. Um, it's relevant for someone out there. You know, someone out there's been waiting for Gil to come out, and he's like, Ooh, daddy, I get to play my elemental spirit magic deck, and my wind blade costs one less mana. Or no, my wind blade still costs two mana, but I can use it to make other cards cost one less mana. But I don't think this is a card you're going to be seeing in Fox so much. Uh, because it, you would need nine stones to take out an opposing griffin, uh, which is really the only thing that Fox cares about. They, they've kind of got enough answers for Abdul at this point between um, Dark Purge and Shade and all that, but I really don't think Fox is going to end up running this over Dark Purge uh, unless they are, for some reason, a two co or a three-color version of Fox that is green base instead of black base um, and, like, really cut down on the black. Like, they'd have to be running, like, uh, four non-black stones for them to consider this over Dark Purge, but even then, they'd probably still go Dark Purge. Um, but I think Lumia Hook is really where this card's going to find its home. Wind Ferryman. Uh, when into your field, you'll the top three cards of your deck. You reveal an element or spear magic, put it in your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your deck. Elements and spear magics are bad. Ergo, this card's bad. Wind of Vitality. Target J resonator gets plus six, plus six. Uh... Personally, I feel like it's just a worse. It's a worse. Bleh. Personally, I feel like it is a worse rapid growth. Uh, you know, obviously you get more value off of the one mana, but I feel like I'm hard pressed to find a time where I can't leave the two mana open for. Like, I don't think Persia is going to play this card over rapid growth, and that's really the only deck I think you want green pump spells, and it's a spirit magic. Is this the secret that I've been missing? Is this the key to it all? Is this the card that makes it so that Gil is a playable ruler? You remove your elemental and for zero mana you give something plus six plus six? Is is that it? Have I cracked the code? Is this what Force of Will was trying to tell me? The answer is probably no. Alright, so now we're getting into the black spoilers. First up, we have Aramon, Malicious Eye of the Dark. So this is one of the very few cards that you have to put mystery counters on your ruler. Uh, and this is probably one of the worst ones, because it happens when the card dies, and being, you know, a 2-mana 6-6, six, six, uh, it doesn't really have a way to kill itself effectively, so you're not sure how long it's going to take for you to get to that mystery counter, and it could be something that, you know, you needed immediately to play a card on turn 3. 
And it's not always the easiest thing to crash your 6-6 into whatever they played on turn 1 or 2 in order to get your uh, mystery counter on turn 3. Uh, but overall, it does meet the stat line that you need for a 2-drop. It's just too slow. You know, it's it's probably not going to find its way in any Raya deck with how many good cards there are in black that you could run otherwise. Uh, we have Black Blood Knight. He's a 3-mana 8-8 eight, eight with lifelink. Yeah, it's pretty baseline on stats, and then it really doesn't do anything outside of the lifelink. I could see it as, like, a way for control decks, you know, black base control decks to try and compete with Prissia, but overall, you're really looking at a lackluster card here that doesn't really do anything doesn't impact the board. You know, three drops in this game are going to have to be really impactful if you're going to run them. Uh, we have to compare this to thing like uh, the Sinister Vizier Abdul, you know, um, Lilia's Petal's Assistant. That's all the three drops I can think of that are seeing play right now. So, obviously, really doesn't compare. Then we have Blood Spray. This card's not good. Uh, a lot of people want this card to be good, a lot of people think this card is good, this card is not good, because at the end of the day, as I was talking about earlier in this video, two mana, draw two cards, at chance speed, is not good in Force of Will. And yeah, it's got the the caveat of remove a mystery counter, destroy a, a resonator with total cost two or less, and anytime we talk about killing a resonator with total cost two or less, er, you know, you have to think of Abdul. And if you are playing a Raya deck, I have to believe that you are not a deck that cares about Abdul. Black has a lot of Abdul removal cards. You have, you know, Dark Purge, you have Heteroclite Excalibur, Final Battle. Uh, you know, that's really all you need. Uh, Shade. Shade's a big one. And I, I just don't think you... You know, Mystery Counters are a very valuable resource. They're the most impactful of all the counters that you have. So removing one, two, draw two cards, lose 300 life, and uh, destroy an Abdul or maybe a Melfi, or maybe a Fiery Fox, it just doesn't seem worth it. Especially not an Araya deck, like, you, there, the meta is so fast that the cards that you play on turn 2 have to be extremely impactful. And yeah, you know, you can make the argument that you're saving this for later in the game, but the later in the game you get, the less relevant destroying a 2 drop is, and the drawing 2 cards is, is never something that I want to put in my deck. Uh, at least if, you know, especially if you, because you can't play it on turn 2 in this game, it's not reasonable. Maybe in an anti-Fox mirror, but you know, definitely not in just your average game of Force of Will. Uh, Dark Elf of the Murky Grove. Uh, this is... No, this is not the Elf I was thinking of. Uh, she's just whenever you... Whenever damage is dealt to you, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And for four mana, for an understudied card that, you know, has to take damage multiple times to get the plus one, plus one counters, and sure, you could make the argument that if you're running it in a Dark Elf deck, then you're kind of facilitating your own strategy. You know, the Dark Elves are all about dealing damage to yourself, and then every time you do that she gets a little bigger, but in order for her to meet the baseline of what I would need for a 4-4, four four, you already need to ping yourself twice, which probably isn't happening the turn she comes out. You might get it once. If you already have the 1-1 one one on field that's dealing 102 in your opponent, then yeah, you'll get it twice and you'll get her up to the stat line, then she'll only get bigger from there. But the problem is, that's just fucking bad. Um, you know, I, I don't want to have to play Dark Elves to make my four, to make this 4- like, this is not the 4-drop that Dark Elves needed. This card is extremely low impact. It's just a big body that doesn't start off big and takes ramp up time, and that's not good. Uh, you know, especially when you're talking about a meta that's full of, of you know, turn two and turn three explosions, uh, and then you're talking about a four drop that needs ramp up time. Ridiculous. Dark Elf Sorcerer. This is the only good Dark Elf card. Uh, whenever a ruler or resonator you control deals damage to you, uh, this card deals that much damage to your opponent. Uh, because these things stack, so if you have like four of these on the field, then you know you get to deal your you do your Freya effect, get back a Dark Elf, deal 300 to yourself, deal four, deal, sorry, 1200 to your opponent. Um, I had heard that there was like a black red um, Dark Elf tree deck running around, but I haven't seen it, so don't know a whole lot about that. But that does seem to be the most viable way to run Dark Elves right now, in my opinion. Although I, I don't think that it's viable, uh, but. More to the point, this is the card that Dark Elves need to see more of. They need more cards like this that really reward you for the the impact on yourself that you're having on your own life total, because ramping up on plus one, plus one counters on your four drop isn't impactful. It's it's not good. So let's see what the other Dark Elves do. You have Dark Elf Spy. This is the guy I was talking about, the one drop 4-4 four, four, uh, at the end of each turn. At the end of your turn, sorry. It deals 100 damage to each player. This is the kind of thing that you need to facilitate your own strategy of getting your your own life total hit without actually being huge impact on you. And then the fact that it hits your opponent, obviously, is also very good. 
but you know, outside of a Dark Elf deck, this card isn't going to see any play, and I don't think Dark Elves are a good deck. Dark Knight Butterfly, uh, so, you know, your opponent discards a card, so, so far we have Viola's Machinations, which obviously doesn't see play. Uh, and then if it was Awakened, your opponent discards two cards instead, but in order to Awaken it, you have to remove two Mystery Counters. And as I was talking about earlier, Mystery Counters are the hardest counters in the game to amass. You know, Rhea can tap for one, versus Kyrick tapping to go up to ten, things like that. And a lot of the good Mystery Counter cards require two Mystery Counters or at least one, but it's really hard to get mystery counters as a generic thing, you'd have to play a mono black stone in order to get them on your ruler if you're not Rhea, and really I think the most important part of mystery counters is Rhea's J ruler side ability, I think that's what you want to be saving up your mystery counters for, not spending them on a one mana spiral of despair, especially because you can't play this card turn one and awaken it, because you're not going to have two mystery counters, unless you go tap Rhea instead of a stone turn one, and then energize into this, and that's fucking terrible. It's it's really it really is a spiral of despair at that point. You're still kind of paying two mana for it because you didn't call a stone turn one. Um, so you know, it's just eh. I don't think this card's ever gonna see play, especially because your opponent gets to choose the cards. Like it's not even Dark Storm. Uh, here we go, Dark Revolution. This is a card that I like a lot because we did need a reanimator spell back in New Frontiers with Dance of Shadows rotating. So this one, it's the same cost as Dance of Shadows. It's not quick cast, which is suddenly very relevant, you know, with Fair Spell running around being one of, if not the best card in the set. And I really like this card as a one of in Fox. Uh, it, the creature gets to stick around. So if you bring back a Griffin and you, you know, you ramp into two more stones, that Griffin's gonna stay there forever. You don't feel, you know, like you have to immediately make a Chimera with it like you do with Dance of Shadows or End of Days. So it's nice to finally get a Reanimator spell that lets the creature stick around because, you know, that's really going to help out the reanimate, stra like the reanimate Captain Hook strategies that you might see in, like, Charlotte or Lumia decks. Uh, you know, it's also good for Umer combo, although that, that, that one doesn't matter as much, because, you know, you were probably playing Lumia Umer combo, in which case the Umer was getting flickered anyway. But overall, a, a very solid card, one of the one of the better reanimator spells that we've seen over the course of Force of Will. I think End of Days is probably my favorite reanimator spell, but it just doesn't see play. And it's it's completely understandable why it doesn't. Black Red is kind of a hard color to get into, especially with the way the meta's been going lately. But overall, I think Dark Revolution is a very good card. Dark Riding Hood. So this card has a lot of text, which generally means it's a good card. Um, so the one thing that I've learned to do when evaluating cards is you look at this and it says, as long as your life is 2,000 or less, so you, you say, okay, how does this card play in Tree? So, uh, it gets poisonous when it's you're at 2,000 or less. It gets a thousand when you're or it's swiftness when you're at a thousand or less. Uh, when it enters the field, you can remove two mystery counters from your ruler, J ruler. If you do remove target resonator from the game, uh, you know it's kind of hard to judge that one because removing two mystery counters is a lot to destroy to remove one resonator from the game because that's what Raya does on her J ruler side is tap to you know kill a, a resonator, but the fact that it doesn't cost, you know, the tapping of your J ruler is, is probably worth it, especially if you're, you know, in a, in a game state where you can really ramp up mystery counters, but I don't know that this is the kind of card I would be playing in my Raya deck. Uh, and then whenever she attacks, she deals 200 damage to target player or resonator, and you gain 200 life. So that stacks on top of the poisonous ability, so if your life is 2,000 or less than she attacks, she deals 200 something and kills it, and you gain 200 life. So this card is really, really good in tree. Um, because often your life will be at 2,000 or less, and very often your life will be at a thousand, or very often your life will be at 2,000 or less, and often your life will be at a thousand or less. So, a three mana t uh, seven eight swiftness that um, can kill things on attack is actually pretty good. Uh, and overall, I like this card a lot. I think it's a must include in your tree deck, and I know you're playing black and tree because you know you need to have black green for the tree ability. So, you're already color locked. You might as well get one of the better cards in your colors. But. That being said, I don't think it's playable in anything other than Tree. I don't know why these are taking so long to load, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so Demonic Rabbit, when it's put into your graveyard from the field, deals 500 damage to you. Uh, so this is like kind of a Dark Elf card. You know, it doesn't really make sense to have this downside for being an overstatted card when it's overstatted by 100, 100, and for the most part, you don't, like, Force Will isn't a game that curves out and like pl everybody plays an 8-8 on turn 3 and then you go, ha ho, finally I can trade down because I played my 3-mana 9-9. That's not how Forceful works. 
Uh, although this card does have the best synergy with the, the three drop dark health I was talking about earlier that deals damage to your opponent when a resonator deals damage to you that you control. Wait a minute. Now, it says resonator you control, and when this card goes to your graveyard, you no longer control it, which means that it wouldn't redirect the damage. This card's fucking terrible. Feast on Mortals. As an additional card to play this card, banish a resonator, and then it catapult turtles, and then you gain life equal to banish resonator's defense. A lot of people think about this card as like a one of finisher in like Fox or Makage or things like that, where I get to go like attack with my griffin and then sack my griffin, deal 1200 to my opponent, I gain 1200. And you're never really going to get down to situations playing Fox where like you're like, oh man, if I could just deal this extra 1200 damage, I would win the game. Because you're going to be able to deal that next turn. You know, maybe in some Fox Mirrors you'll come down to that, but it's definitely not a situation that's going to come up often enough to warrant running this card. Especially when you consider, what if I open with this card? It's fucking terrible. It's not, you know, quick cast, it, uh, fucking, it's four mana. It, it It's so low impact for four mana. There are so many other things you could do in Fox for four mana, and that's the only deck I've seen people talk about playing this in. You get Dark Revolution for four mana, and I would prefer that heavily. Because um, then, like, you can get back an Omit, that's basically going to win you the game, too. Overall, just not a card that's going to find a home. And even if it did, I wouldn't be convinced that this card is good. Four mana is just so much in force. Freyla, uh, at the end of your turn, you know, it's the black ruler. At the end of your turn, you may put a Dark Elf from your graveyard in your hand, and if you do, this card deals 300 damage to you. Uh, as you've seen and will see, I believe there are still more Dark Elves to come. Uh, the Dark Elf archetype is all about dealing damage to yourself. So we go to the GA ruler side, where when this card enters the field, put target Dark Elf from your graveyard into the field. It's one of the better enter abilities on a J ruler. You know, you get immediate impact. She's a 10 8, not a terrible stat line for 3 mana. And whenever this card attacks another Dark Elf, you control gains plus 4, plus 4, and swiftness until end of turn. For 1 red mana, this card gains swiftness until end of turn. And for black red, this card deals 100 damage multiplied by the number of Dark Elves you control to your opponent. So, you essentially flip her for 4 mana, and then, you know, because you want to have that red to give her swiftness. So you flip her, you revive a Dark Elf, you give her swiftness, you attack, another Dark Elf gets plus 4, plus 4, and swiftness. And then, you know, at any point, you can play the Black Red to deal 100 to your opponent for the number of Dark Elves you control. Dark Elves is definitely a deck that wants to go wide. Because you have, you get, the more Dark Elves you have, the more impact you get off of, I believe, the Stone uh, does something for Dark Elves. You have the, you know, when this card deals damage to you, it deals to your opponent as well. Uh, you have the 1-1, one, one, or the deal 100 damage to your opponent, deal 100 damage to yourself. And the more of those you have out, you know, the more you're going to be ramping into that. Uh, end game strategy of like just burning out your opponent, but overall just really not making the cut against the bigger decks of the format like you know Prisia, Fox, Makage, uh, Lumia even. Unfortunately, it's just too all in on your ruler strategy. And you know if you're flipping on four mana, what Dark Elf do you really have in the graveyard that's going to make a huge impact that you didn't put back in your hand? Uh, overall, just you know. It's definitely got a lot of potential going forward, but there's no way it's going to make the cut in this meta. Gate to Outer World. This is probably one of the worst cards in the set. Uh, when I interest field, your opponent removes a resonator they control from the game, uh, meaning that your... I don't know if people read this card correctly, but it means that your opponent gets to choose. And then you can tap it and pay the cost of the resonator to play it from the removed area. But this card initially costs 4 mana. Absolute garbage. Hold up, Freya's left hand. When this card enters your field, if you do not control a card named Safina, Rhea's right hand, uh, put target card with that name from your graveyard into the field, and then it's a 7-7 seven, seven as long as your life is 2,000 or less. I actually... So, once again, you know, you look at the 2,000 or less thing and you're like, alright, how does this card play in Tree? And a 2-mana 7-7, seven, seven, really not something that Tree is lacking. Uh, and then, you know, pulling things out of deck and grave is a little awkward for Tree, because they do use their deck as a resource. Things will be in the exile. And these things don't interact with that. I'll show you the next one. Oh, what the hell? Why are they not next to each other in this set? That doesn't make any sense. Alright, um, let me look up the other hand. So you can see what I'm talking about. So you have Safina, uh, Freya's right hand, and when when uh, this card enters the field, if you do not control a card named Hilda, then you search your deck for it, and it's also a 7-7 seven, seven, as long as your life is 2,000 or less. So, this one pulls from Grave, and this one pulls from Deck. Uh, and overall, they don't actually facilitate the Dark Elf strategy, which is a little unfortunate because they are some of the better cards that Dark Elves have. It doesn't really make sense for the ruler's right and left hand to not 
you know, deal damage to yourself in order for, you know, the, the deck to fucking function. Um, overall, the most impact I see you getting out of these cards is in Fox if Demonic Dead gets banned. That's, like, where I think these cards are going to have a home if that happens. Until then, I really don't think they're going to do anything. There's just really not a whole lot of value in, you know, uh, putting them from... I believe the other... Yeah, uh, other guy gets deck to hand, this one gets grieved to field, so uh, overall, you're not, like, if you could pull the other one out of deck, they might be okay, but, or from deck to field, rather, then they might be okay, but they don't do that, so, neither of them do. Lethal Alert, this card's absolutely fucking insane. This is what put Makage back on the map. Uh, destroy target damage resonator. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Makage says, uh, his ruler side says, one black mana, deal 100 damage to target resonator, put a counter on Makage. So, this is essentially a stoning to death in Makage decks. So, absolutely insane. Very, very good card. Moon in the Mist. This is another card that I feel like Raya decks are going to feel pressured to run. Uh, you know, it is outside of what you want to be paying for a quick cast removal spell as 4 mana instead of 3. But honestly, I think putting a Mystery Counter on your J Ruler is worth it. You know, there's really not a lot that does it, and it's a, it's a valuable resource within the deck. So I think that this is something you're unfortunately going to have to run in uh, Raya decks. And I think you run it in absolutely nothing else. You know, you would just play Endless Knight or uh, Swirling Demon Dimension, depending on your deck. But, you know, played in Raya, nothing else. Maybe a black control deck that is playing Mystery Counters, but I don't think any of those are very good. I'm talking like Makage that plays the Raya Stone and Moon in the Mist and other things like that to ascertain Mystery Counters and then play, I don't know, something that uses Mystery Counters. But I haven't liked any of those lists that I've seen. Moonlight Shadow. Peace always ends when no one... Wait, shit. I fucked it up. Fuck. Alright, let's start over. Peace always ends when one least expects it. Um, yeah, this is a 1-mana 4-4. It does nothing. It is a vampire. If it was a 1-mana 6-7 and a vampire, this card might almost be playable in vampire decks. But it isn't, so it's bad. Uh, Safina Ray is right-handed. I already talked about this card. Shade Assassin. So whenever this card deals damage to a resonator, destroy that resonator and it control you know, and it gains swiftness as long as you can control another dark elf. So obviously Freya is a dark elf. Uh, overall I don't really like poisonous things in this game. Or death touch or however you want to call it. And it doesn't have target attacks, so it's a little less impactful again. But you know, it, it, sure it's just like, oh your opponent can't ever like attack with their big guys, or you can just run this into it, but uh, you know. Let's so let's let's say you're playing against Prisio. You throw this down, and you know they play their fucking Sacred Elf. They pass you like attack with this. They don't block with their Sacred Elf, um, and then they play like a uh, what's his name Sylvia. Attack you. This thing can't block whatever, and then like you can try and attack this into the Sylvia, and you might get the Sacred Elf. But overall, like your one mana card, you know one for oneing and dealing 200 damage to your opponent if you played it on turn one, and like you don't even get to choose what you one for one on, and it dies to Tama. That's the big thing about this versus Fox. Like, you're going to die to Tama. This against Lumia decks, for the most part, a lot of them are still running Tama. And then, you know, against Prissy, this card's just never going to make the cut. You know, it's it's going to get chump blocked by, like, a Sacred Elf. I'm like, oh, wow, cool. You killed their Mana Dork, like, two turns later at chance speed. It's just not worth it. Stealth Demon. Oh, God. If I have to explain to you why this card's terrible, we you haven't been watching my videos. Um... <laughs> You know, but in case you didn't, we'll go over this anyway. So five mana cards are supposed to win you the game. This is an eight six. That's not good. All right, so five mana eight six. You're like, holy shit. This this card has to have the most broken effect in Force Will. This has to be Captain Hook on crack for me to consider playing this card. And you go down and it's, it has flying, and you're like, oh yeah, you know it has flying. This is the best card in Force Will. Of course it has flying. When this card is put into a graveyard from the field, here we go, big reveal. It deals 600 damage to your opponent. And then you're like, oh, wait, there's more text. Freya, I trust your well, although I don't really care. Came Demon of Ice. Sick Burn. Nice flavor text, Force Will. But aside from the Sick Burn on the flavor text, this card's garbage. Sword of the New Moon. Uh, so this is kind of like, it's a worse Fatal Push. Um, because the base is only a 1-drop. And then, you know, a 4-drop if you awakened it, but... Overall, if you awakened it, I think this card's actually pretty good. Uh, mostly against Prissia, because it does kill Maria Bella, 
uh, is so when you think of oh you know so impactful one drops two drops so forth in the game one drops you want to look out for like Thomas sacred elf those are like impactful one drops impactful two drops are like Abdul anytime you read two drop you read Abdul for three drop you're like all right why does this card say three drop and then for four drops you read Mary Abella um, so anytime something says destroy total resonator with total cost four or less you go oh cool Mary Abella removal that's how you should be thinking and you know black's not super lacking on Mariabella removal, but doing it at one mana at quick cast is actually really important because that means that you can uh, respond to the trigger of her getting a stone and you don't have to pay the extra mana because they might be getting a breeze counter. Uh, and it's possible that they even, you know, if they haven't called a stone yet, they can like pull their red stone and then call a green red stone and, you know, they'll have two blast counters and a breeze counter. And by the time your turn rolls around and you remove it, you know, they've shot one of your resonators for a thousand damage. They've made you pay an extra mana for that spell. So having access to removing it at source at instant speed is actually really important, especially in black, uh, something that was lacking instant speed removal for big creatures lately. Uh, sure, you know, you can just heteroclade anything or final battle it, but I don't really want to have to pay more mana for those cards, so this is a card that takes care of that. And, you know, it's only one mystery counter as opposed to two, so it's actually pretty easy to get into even if you're not playing Rhea. Uh, although, as I was saying earlier, I don't really like those decks. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a huge impact for your Rhea to remove a mystery counter. Uh, and then I do think Rhea might be able to be a black deck with a good Persia matchup, but because she is a 12-12 flyer, but... You know, it remains to be seen. She would need more support, or I would need to think harder about it. I'm not sure which, but overall, I think this is a big step in the right direction. Tactics of the Dark Elves. Up to two resonators you control cannot be destroyed until end of turn. Gain whenever this card deals damage to a resonator, destroy the resonator until end of turn. So, two of you guys get Death Touch, and they can't be destroyed uh, until end of turn. You know, obviously, chance speed. If it was instant speed or quick cast, this card might actually be relevant. But as I was saying earlier, I'm not a fan of Death Touch in this game. It just, uh, it's a little, it's really low impact, you know, it's cool in magic, but not in force, just because, like, the, you're not really value trading into creatures, um, you know, you're not really blocking, you, there's, like, no chump blocking in force, really, it's just not a thing that happens, um, and your death touch creatures always tend to be really understated, so essentially this might make them just say unblockable, or I could still block them with, like, a bird or a tama or something, but overall, not a fan of this card. The three evil little pigs. Um, this card's a mouthful. It's a five mana four four. So you're like, all right, here we go again. The five mana understated tall hell has to be a good card. Fairy tale, good resonator type to have. It's got support. Uh, but when it enters the field, it makes two four four tokens. Uh, one of them, when it dies, you gain four hundred life. The other, when it dies, your opponent loses four hundred life, or deals four hundred damage to your opponent. Uh, and that's just really low impact. Even if you could get this out, and so even if you could ramp into this in something like, um, you know. Lumia, and then, you know, you get asked the question, why aren't you just playing Captain Hook, and the answer is because I don't want to play Blue Steve, um, you know, I wanted to try something new, uh, and then, you know, this is still just early low impact resonator to be playing, uh, 12, 12 worth of bodies onto the board, but, you know, doesn't actually trade with a 12, 12 is the problem, uh, and then, you know, losing, your opponent losing 400 life and you gaining 400 life isn't very relevant. You know, sure, it, like, swarms the board a little bit if you're playing, like, a pump spell deck, but overall for five mana, I just want a lot more impact onto my cards. Transforming Vampire. 5-4 uh, lifelink. You know, as I was saying earlier, it just doesn't have the abilities on it. It doesn't have the stat line on it. It should be a 2-mana 6-6, but it does have the Resonator-type Vampire, but having vampires that just, you know, gain you life off of how much damage they deal is not impactful. And this dies to, like, every removal spell in the game, including in a chance speed memory to Memoria, um, which isn't something you see very often. So, good on you for dying to even more things than normal, you fucking useless piece of shit. Treasonous Guard. This card ends the field, it's just to damage to each player. So this is another thing that, like, is pretty good for Dark Elves. Uh, it meets your baseline on the stat line that you want, which means it can trade into things like uh, Sylvia, beat up mana dorks. Um, for the most part, I'm never going to like complain about a 2-mana 6-6, just because I have been playing Fox for so long. I know the value of 6-6 is overrunning your opponent. And then 200 damage to each player becomes 400 damage to your opponent if you if you have the other elf on the field. But overall, the Dark Elves just don't deal enough damage to you to make the deal damage to your opponent resonator worth it. And that's kind of the problem they're going to run into, is that it's just such a slow burn. And then, you know, because you're not playing Tree, your opponent can still gain life. And yeah, you could make the argument of like, oh, I'll play Serto. But unfortunately, the other card, 
uh, doesn't actually let Serto's damage to you redirect back to your opponent because it only says Ruler or Resonator. Um, and then you might even find that your own life total is running a little low because you're not going to have that 3 drop on the field for the entirety of the time that you're burning yourself out. And ideally you get to attack your opponent more than they attack you, but that doesn't always happen. So that's, that's why Dark Elves aren't good, unfortunately. Because I do think they're pretty cool in concept. Truth amongst darkness. So I, I it's a remnant. Uh, look at your opponent's hand. Remove a card from the game. Uh, three mana though. You know, a pretty hefty cost. This isn't something you want to play on turn three, which means it's not something you want to play until a lot later in the game. And it's not a bad top deck late in the game because it does have remnant. So if your opponent ever tries to hold something, then you know you can get rid of it. But three mana is just a hefty cost. So this probably isn't something you want to play more than one of, maybe two. Uh, and overall, I just, you know, I think it's a little too low impact. Uh, I could almost see it being played in Fox going forward, just because the one thing that I found is how useless your planting beans are after you've sent Demonic Dead to the graveyard, because you used to have Dark Arthur and Dance of Shadows as secondary targets to send to the graveyard. And if I could send this and even only get one use off of it, I'm playing Fox, so I have the most mana out of any deck in the game. And I will eventually get to a point where I'm just like, alright, I would like to Manticore, but it would be better to either Griffin or Omit. And then if I just play a Truth Amongst Darkness. I mean, obviously, like, that's the best case scenario I can find for this card in New Frontiers, and it still sounds pretty bad. So, it's like a cute gimmicky thing that some Fox decks might do, but overall I don't think this card's going to make any kind of impact like that. Uh, Vicious Wounded Beast, you put two mystery counters on your J-Ruler. Unfortunately, it is a five mana card, and at that point, I think I've already found other ways to... I've probably got an appropriate number of mystery counters on my on my J-Ruler. Um, and I really don't know that I want to be getting to five mana in a Rhea deck. I think I want to be flipping her as soon as possible, and then either attacking with my 12-12, or just constantly tapping to pop their resonators. So getting to five mana in a deck like that might actually prove to be pretty difficult for you. I could see you getting to four mana, and then like you flip, and you're like, all right, all I need to do is call one more stone to play this guy. But then you have to wait, you know, calling another stone against popping a resonator. And sure, it's reasonable that you'll run out of mystery counters eventually and go, okay, let me, you know, uh, pl call my stone, play my five drop, get more mystery counters, kind of refuel my thing. But if you haven't won by the time you've popped three resonate or four, three or four resonators for free then I don't think you were winning this game anyway, and I really don't think this is the card that's going to put you back in the game if that's the case. Vitality Drain. Uh, target player loses a thousand life, you gain a thousand life, and then if you remove the mystery counter, it deals a thousand to a target resonator. Uh, overall, you know, just not very good. You're probably not going to get this last part off. Uh, there's not a whole lot that you care about in black that has a thousand or less. Like Mariabella, maybe, but... Uh, God, do you see this fucking mana cost? <laughs> uh, you'd be better off playing the Fatal Push card at that point. Um, and then your opponent losing a thousand life and you gaining a thousand life is just not something you care about doing for five mana, even at instant speed. If you ever get fair spelled on this card, you're gonna feel like a goddamn idiot. Um, you know, it's not terrible as a sideboard against tree, I guess, but it also is uh, because you you know you nullify that gain a thousand life part. And at five mana, this isn't the card that's gonna like actually win you the sudden death against tree. Um, and ambition of lapis, I believe it is called, is still the better mirror breaker for trees going into time. Let me just make sure on that. Yeah, ambition of lapis. Um, you'll you'll see this card in tree side decks, and it's for top cut if the trees are going into time. Uh, because it does cause your opponent to lose life, so you can actually win in time. Uh, whereas this card costs entirely too much mana to do that, and it doesn't, you know. Ambition of Lapis comes down a lot earlier, and it actually impacts the board. Wolf's Rain, put three darkness. Put three, three, three darkness. Beast Wolf. Resonated tokens with swiftness and precision into the field at the next end of turn, remove them from the game. This card's pretty bad. Um, you know, swiftness precision on my 3-3 three, three is a little strange. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm attacking with my 3-3. Three, three. Uh, obviously, they better have swiftness. They die at end of turn. If they, if they stuck around, I'd almost be more inclined to say this card isn't as terrible as it seems. But, you know, you get 900 damage of swiftness precision onto the board spread out. And it's just so low impact. Like, the fuck? Maybe you're attacking them into an Abdul, but for three men in a black deck, you could just you could just blast an Abdul into Oblivion with one of, like, ten cards... And then what? What I want, you're like, oh well, like I really want to, you know, attack them for 300 after I kill their Abdul. And it's like, all right, buddy, you got me. Maybe you want to play this card because it has little red on it. I know you're out there, um, but you know, overall, just a very low impact card. Not something that you're actually going to see in New Frontiers. 
Now we'll Fox and Prissy running around. All right, now we get into the the neutral cards, and I actually do like some of these. So Idol of Magic. Uh, I actually like this card quite a bit. Um, you know, it's one mana, banish it, filter a mana uh, when it, when it is put into a graveyard from the field, draw a card. So uh, Ryan and I were fooling around with a couple tree and Makagi decks that played this and played Grim, and you would just throw this down, and then you would Grim this card on your own. You would search uh, Urashime Taro if you were playing Makage or you would search Dark Riding Hood if you were playing Tree, and then you would draw a card, because the drawing card is separate from the mana ability, whereas on the other idols, it's attached. Um, because you can... It, it had to be separate. Alright, so basically what I mean by that is, um, this card going to the graveyard and you drawing a card is not attached to the producing mana part, and it had to be that way because otherwise uh, you could draw a card and your opponent wouldn't be able to respond because you are produce you are using a mana ability and they don't use the chase. So drawing a card while not using the chase would actually be a little confusing. So they separate it into two abilities. It's not very high impact on the card, um, but you know it is kind of cheeky in that grim thing. So you know as I said we tried around with this and I, I we just couldn't make it work. And I think that's that was like the best case scenario for this card. So even though I like it, I don't think it's gonna you know make the cut in new frontiers decks for quite a bit. Idol of Vitality, this is probably the worst one, and one that a lot of people seem to think is one of the better ones. Um, you know, it's a constant threat of, you know, deal 200, uh, or like, buff your guy by 200, and then draw a card, but just play Rapid Growth. And if you're playing this in a, a deck that can't play Rapid Growth, then I don't know what the fuck you're playing, because everything is green right now. Uh, but let's say you're not playing a green deck, and it's really important to you that you protect your Abdul. Like, you want to play this card turn one, play your Abdul turn two, and then protect your Abdul turn three. Just play Castle of Oni on turn three. Uh, overall, I, I can't see this card ever making its way into a new Frontiers deck, period, no matter what the meta looks like. Idol of Willpower, easily, this one's actually the worst one. I don't think anyone's going to argue with me on that one. Statue in the Sacred Temple. So I actually just found out last night that the Angel doesn't go away at end of turn. I don't know why I thought it did, but I did. Um, it really doesn't change my opinion on this card. Although I do kind of like it as a one of in Kaguya Moonbeam Butterfly decks. But overall, it's it's kind of like a worse Mary Bell. Um, and Mary Bell wasn't really something that we were seeing in control decks, which is the only thing I could think of that would run this. Uh, you know... Sure, it's cool that it facilitates your mana, and it's not color locked like Sise was. Like Sise, you had to be red green base to uh, filter all your mana, but then that also gave you all the resonance triggers on every kind of stone. It was kind of cool. Um, so they serve two different kind of functions. But overall, I don't think you want to play multiples of this card, and I really don't think you are ever going to have this 1010 light angel resonator be relevant. Uh, so you know, overall, I don't think it's going to make its way into a lot of new frontiers deck. I definitely think it'll pop up in some top 8 lists at some point. It's possible. I, I don't think they'll pop up in any of my top 8 lists, but um, you know, it's definitely not a card that's unplayable. It's not as garbage as the other idols. It's not something that... It's not a bad card. I just think it's a little low impact. I don't think it really fits into the meta right now, but this is the start of a new cluster, and that means that in a year we're going to have an entirely new meta. Uh, even sooner if, you know, Force Will decides they need to ban some things again. Uh, which isn't out of the question in my head. Uh, so, you know, overall not a terrible card. Demonic Soul Stone, so, um, you know, uh, tap 2 and tap it, so 3 mana essentially. Uh, deal 100 to your opponent, multiply by the number of Dark Elves you control to each player. Uh, this is what I was talking about, about Dark Elves really wanting to go wide. You can get this ability, you can also get the ability on the other side of Freya. But at the end of the day, it is still a mono black stone. And sure, it's treated as a darkness magic stone, but in New Frontiers, we don't really have things that care about your stone typing anymore. Because uh, a lot of the, ch the chance standbys and stealth cards are rotated, and those are really the ones that cared about your stone typing. Um, it does. I think Darkness Stone is the most relevant one to have right now because of Shade um, and Sinister Vizier Abdul. But outside of that, the other ones, like, it doesn't really matter. It matters more for, like, Wanderer, but in New Frontiers it doesn't really matter. And overall, I don't even know that you would play this card in Freya, because playing a mono-black deck doesn't sound appealing. Playing a two-color deck sounds more appealing. And then you can, if you can have perfect mana, just have perfect mana. Don't, you know, I can see you playing, like, one of this card, but overall you want to be mostly on whatever your two colors are. Serious Magic Stone. Um, I actually, like, I think this is one of the better ones. Banish a light and tap it and put a... Or Pay a light, banish it, 
uh, put a golem from your graveyard into your hand. Uh, you're probably going to be wanting to get back one of your big-ass golems, but, you know. There's also the revival spell uh, that mobilizes your golem, but overall it's, it's nice that this card can actually turn into, like, physical card advantage. Saintly Elvenstone, tap to give an elf a plus one, plus one buff. This one's actually pretty bad. Uh, because we are used to plus two plus, like, we're used to plus two plus two buffs on generic resonators of a color, a little red. Um, and then this just, uh, you know, a plus one plus one buff on what is likely a one one token is just pretty non impactful. And yeah, it's forceful, so you can do it twice, but the cost of a mana, I don't know that I want to be buffing my elf by one one. Ah, the variant cards. Um, so this is an 810 flyer with you have a water gem, which is still unplayable. This is a 5-5 five five that says target resonator can't block this turn, uh, which is just a worse Prisia, or Sylvia, I mean, and I don't think you need to be running 8 Sylvia, especially when this one doesn't have swiftness. Although I do, th for what it's worth, I do think this is the most playable New Frontiers one. Uh, variant Giant Squid still doesn't do anything. Variant Fairs Escort, uh, target elf can't be destroyed until the beginning of your next turn. That one's actually a lot better than the... Uh, the non-variant version, but I still don't think it makes the cut as a 5-drop. Then Variant Vicious Wounded Beast uh, gains first strike at the cost of 100 defense, which is actually a lot better. Um, but once again, still not very good. Especially If it had 1200 attack, then first strike's relevant. You can trade into Griffins and things like that, but at 1000, still not doing anything super impactful. And then we just have the Basic Stones. Uh, basic Stones, some of the worst cards in the game as far as New Frontiers is concerned. You know, sure, you have the... Um, You'll play basics in like Mariabella decks most often Persia, but I always this one always looks like a darkness stone to me. And, and wind magic stone. And and then you have the uh the draft rulers, which are new frontiers legal, but they don't have energize, and they are just ten thousand percent worse versions of the actual rulers that they are made to replicate. Um because I I don't think that limited uh Limited counters are going to make any kind of impact in New Frontiers, especially when you're trading off Energize for it, and you're overall just looking at a ruler that doesn't do anything. Uh, Mafina's probably the most playable one in New Frontiers, just because um, Shleia is so low impact on her own. I guess Leaf Elder could do the same thing, because he's basically got Gil's ability, but like the red, black, and white rulers uh, have too many other things that the, their actual rulers do to be you know, ever replaced. Um... So yeah, that's that's the end of the set review. Overall, I, I like this set a lot. Um, yeah, it was a little low impact. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I would have liked to play Worlds as uh, Raya Cluster. I think that would have been kind of cool. Um, but I don't, so. Um, overall, you know, not a bad set, not a great set. Uh, it introduces a lot of cool concepts, and I actually do think the rulers from this set have a lot of potential going forward in New Frontiers. Um, Mostly Fayer, I would say, but, you know, at the moment, I, I still just think Fox and Prissy are the way to go, or Fox, Makage, things like that. We're in a very triangle meta, and nothing from this set really upsets that. I think that it would have been a lot better if Fayer's spell wasn't printed. I think we would have had a much healthier meta. I don't think Fox would be as dominating as it is. Um, but, you know, overall, uh, pretty happy with the way the set turned out, and I think there's a lot of cool concepts going forward. I think there's a lot of... Uh, like sleeper cards that could make their way into decks. Um, and yeah, you know, until next time, I'm Aaron Miles from On Tilt Gaming. Have a good one.